This slows things down a lot more. The heat shield is released. The surface of Mars is approaching quickly. Then the back shell and parachute is jettisoned and retro rockets fire. The camera searches for the correct place to touch down. Once ready, the sky crane activates, lowering the rover to the ground. Once sensors indicate that the rover is safely on the surface, the descent stage separates and does a flyaway, crash landing far away from the rover. And here we are on Mars. Now we are joined by two of our planetary planetary scientists, Dr. Mariah Baker and Dr. John Grant. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. All right, we know that we're getting close. Thanks for to, having us. We, we know we're getting close to landing on Mars. My count says about two hours and fifty minutes away. Mariah, you are a member of the Perseverance Science Team. What's happening right now? A lot of excitement, a lot of nerves. Uh, the spacecraft is is finishing up its seven month journey to the red planet. It's traveled over 200 million miles and it's got about, I think less than 100,000 left to go, which uh, sounds like a lot, but it's uh, traveling pretty quickly still about 40,000 miles per hour. So in a couple short hours, it'll be arriving at Mars and we've been monitoring uh, it quick, uh, it as it has been traveling to Mars and through its cruise stage and through the approach. There have been a couple opportunities in the last few weeks to make some final adjustments to the trajectory, um, and everything seems to be uh, working as it's supposed to. So we're we're looking forward to to entering descent and landing. John, uh, it's getting a little busy around Mars these days. It's not just perseverance. Do you want to tell us what el what else is going on up there? Oh, it looks like so. Just in the past week and a half or so. Um, we've had two additional spacecraft uh, enter orbit around Mars, one from the United States. Well, it looks like John's having some internet trouble. Mission looking in the atmosphere of Mars, whereas the China mission um, is one that will separate a lander and eventually touch down on the surface. All right. Uh, Mariah, why do they call this the seven minutes of terror? Yeah, so the seven minutes of terror uh, refers to the seven minutes it takes the spacecraft to descend from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface. Uh, so this is a really exciting uh, time of the mission. It's uh, the, the rover needs to slow down from about 12,000 miles per hour to zero uh, to get to stationary at the surface. Um, and one of the things that's particularly terrifying about uh, EDL, Entry, Descent, Landing, is that it's done entirely autonomously. So there's no human intervention. The rover is on its own. Um, everything has been pre-programmed. Um, and because the communication time uh, between Earth and Mars right now is about 11 minutes, uh, by the time we get word here on Earth that the uh, rover has entered the atmosphere, uh, in reality, it has already landed on the surface one way or the other. Uh, so we're sort of just sitting back and, and hoping that the, the spacecraft uh, does what it's designed to do. If you all have questions, uh, we want to hear from you. Put them in the comment section or you can tweet us at STEMIN30. You can even email us at STEMIN30 at si.edu. We'll try and get to as many questions as we can. Be sure again to tell us where you're watching from, and we'll try and give you a shout out. Speaking of shout outs, we have got a whole bunch of folks tuning in. We've got Missouri, Oklahoma, the Netherlands, California, New York, Idaho, Indiana, Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Emerson Elementary School, Carolina Forest International Elementary in Jacksonville, North Carolina, Italy, New Jersey, homeschoolers from Houston, Texas, and Washington all tuning in. Thank you all so much for watching. Keep those uh, locations coming in and the questions. Our first question uh, is from our email account and someone would like to know, how long does it take to build a Mars rover? It's a great question. Uh, I'll go ahead and take this one. It takes a very long time. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the beginning of the Perseverance mission uh, started back when Curiosity landed about 10 years ago. Um, so it's been almost a decade of, of preparation of this. 
Um, here on Earth, we've got to, uh, there are a lot of steps that need to, to happen before we launch off the surface. Uh, the instruments need to all be designed, calibrated, uh, tested in Mars-like conditions, and then they all need to be incorporated into the spacecraft body. Um, and all of that takes years of preparation. Uh, and then we launch off the surface and head to Mars, and then the real fun begins. All right, Mariah, our next question coming in, or, or John, either one, um, will the rover be returned to Earth? And I know we've got some curators in the space history department that would love to have that rover on display. Is it coming back? John, if you, if you got us, is, is the rover coming back? If not, Mariah, go ahead and jump in. Okay, I was giving John a second to, to maybe uh, get into it. Um, I don't know of any plans to bring the rover back. Uh, we've, we've landed a number of spacecraft on the surface. Um, and once their surface missions have been uh, completed, they, they are still there uh, accumulating dust uh, and keeping each other company. Um, bringing a spacecraft back would be, would be a, a, big, uh, a big ordeal. Um, we are, however, going to hopefully be bringing some uh, samples of Mars rocks and soil back uh, in, in the next decade or so. Uh, and that's actually starting with this mission. So uh, Mars 2020 is starting what's known as the Mars Sample Return Campaign. Um, and so one of the major goals of the mission is to drill uh, and collect material that, they, uh, that the rover will leave in small tubes on the surface uh, for a subsequent rover to come uh, and pick up. And then that will be launched off the surface and. Uh, and given to a, another spacecraft that will return those to Earth. So it's sort of an interplanetary relay race. Uh, but so we will get something back from, from this mission. I just don't know if it's the rover itself. <laughs> We've got a lot of people watching from all over, Alaska, Belgium, Georgia, Virginia, Detroit, uh, Louisiana, Scotland, Boston, Peru, Canada, Barcelona, Hive 20 from Biomed Science Academy in Ohio, Iowa, Oregon, and Maryland, thank you so much for watching. Uh, our next question is, um, and, and Mariah, I know that you've been working with uh, the, this team, so maybe you can answer this. Will we be able to see uh, camera footage from the rover? Cameron, who's in fourth grade, would like to know. Yes, absolutely. We've got a number of, of cameras on board and actually um, some of them will be uh, filming during the descent. Uh, and so we're not going to get those back in, in live in live time, but um, at some point we will be able to watch the descent as the as the rover saw it. Um, and then we've got a number of cameras on board, as I said, that will take uh, images of the surface. And we even have one that has movie capabilities, which is something that's uh, new for this mission and is super exciting for someone like me who studies things that move on the surface um, because we actually can capture that in, in action. Um, so we'll get a lot of great images. Uh, we've got uh, similar cameras to what we had on the Curiosity rover, uh, which has returned really stunning images from the Martian surface. Um, so you should be expecting to see lots of great images of Mars soon. Awesome. I can't wait. And we are about two hours and 43 minutes away from landing. Um, and as soon as we're done with the live chat, we'll hand it off to the NASA TV coverage. So that's coming up here at about 2.15 Eastern time. So make sure you stay watching for that because there's going to be all kinds of great, uh, great stuff coming out today. Um, we've got another question that came in. Are there any science packages on the sky crane that will survive the impact? Great question. Um, I do not know of any. Um, it makes a pretty hard landing on the surface. Uh, so I don't think that anything could survive that. Uh, the Sky Crane's real purpose is to get that rover down to uh, down to the surface safely. And uh, hopefully that that will be achieved. And uh, if it crash lands somewhere far away, that's that's the goal. <laughs> we have our next our next question um, is uh, how does the Mars rover communicate information back to us on, on planet Earth? Uh, this is from a, it's an email from a homeschooler. Uh, I'm not sure if, I know that John is having some issues with the internet, so let's, uh, if John can answer, that's great. If not, Mariah, will let you take that one as well. See if John can catch up, maybe. 
I think we're trying to get John in another way. So Mariah, go ahead and we'll get John back here. In just okay, absolutely. And I'm so sorry. I have actually totally forgotten the question. <laughs> the, the question is, how does the Mars rover communicate information back to us on planet Earth? Yes, and it, absolutely. And it doesn't take just a second. It takes a while, doesn't it? It does take a while. So as I said, there is a delay in the time that uh, the rover collects information and when it can get back to Earth. It depends on how far the planets are from each other. Um, the rover has a couple antennas on board. Um, and so technically, uh, those antennas can provide, uh, can send information directly back to Earth. Um, but when we're doing sort of normal surface operations, we all, uh, often have a lot of data that we're trying to transmit. Um, so we often use the orbiters that are around Mars to transmit information back. So uh, the orbiters that we've got in uh, around the, the planet um, can cross over where the rovers are on the surface um, and they can transmit information to one another. Um, and then the orbiter can send that information back to uh, through the deep space network uh, to antennas here on Earth. And then that gets transmitted to JPL. So it does take a little bit of time. Uh, and sometimes when we uh, call into to planning on any given day, uh, sometimes you can watch the data trickle in as you're sitting there. Um, it takes it takes a bit of time, but um, but we've got sort of a system in place that allows us to get that data back as soon as possible. Awesome. Well, we've got folks tuning in from all around the world. We've got uh, Hawaii uh, homeschoolers in Gulf Shores, Alabama, South Carolina, Colorado, Illinois. Amsterdam, Tasmania in, Aust in Australia, England, Slovakia, Chile, New York, West Virginia, Brazil, Ontario. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Uh, Mariah or John, it looks like we've got John back now. Um, we've got a question here from Elise in Scotland. Uh, how likely is a Perseverance rover to help with human missions to Mars? Mariah, you wanna take that one? Yep, yeah, I got it. Um, yeah, so one of the uh, the primary mission goals actually is to help prepare for human exploration. And this is a part of the mission that I'm particularly excited about. Um, all prior robotic missions have, have been sort of paving the way for humans. We send robots to the surface to uh, scope out what, what's there, test the environment, see what uh, humans would have to work with and would have to deal with. Uh, on the surface, and so that's sort of a precursor to sending humans. But this mission in particular is actually really gonna make that happen. Um, there's a, an interesting uh, new instrument on board called the MOXIE instrument. And uh, what this instrument does is it takes in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide atmosphere on Mars, and it tries to turn it into oxygen that can be used by astronauts on the surface um, and can be turned into uh, propellant to launch back off the surface. Um, so human missions, are, are really on the horizon, um, but they do require a lot of planning and uh, in order to decrease the amount of material we'd have to bring from Earth um, to Mars to sustain these astronauts on the surface, it's important to try and figure out uh, how we can use the resources provided uh, by Mars and uh, by the atmosphere and by the rocks, how we can use those to our advantage to decrease the amount of material we have to bring from Earth. So MOXIE is one of those instruments uh, another one is RIMFAX, and uh, this is the first ground penetrating radar uh, being sent to the surface of Mars. And RIMFAX uh, and other radar instruments could identify subsurface ice that might be able to be accessed uh, and used by astronauts on the surface. So that's another one. This is all uh, falls under the category of what's called in situ resource utilization. Um, so ISRU, uh, these are potential ISRU instruments that can really enable human exploration of Mars in the future. We've got a lot more people from watching all over the world. Moscow, uh, Aug uh, Augustine, Florida, Middle Creek Academy, Ecuador, students at Sussex Charter School, Empire High School in uh, Tucson, Arizona, Oregon, Columbia, United Air Arab Emirates, homeschoolers in Toronto and Alberta, Puerto Rico, United Kingdom. Uh, our next question, uh, Mariah, is, how many rovers are there right now on Mars? That's a great question. So Perseverance will be the fifth. Um, it started with Sojourner, who uh, was a, a technology demonstration actually 
uh, on the Mars Pathfinder mission. And uh, I heard John refer to it in, in the uh, Smithsonian Channel documentary the other day as a microwave on wheels. Uh, it was a very small, small rover, um, and it was basically sent there to test out whether we could rove on the surface. Um, and it was successful. It, it didn't travel very far. I think it only got uh, like tens of meters away from uh, from Mars Pathfinder, but it proved that we could do that. Uh, and so then subsequently we sent uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, um, and then the Curiosity Rover, and now Perseverance. So, um, and they've gotten progressively larger over time. Um, so uh, we've got a couple roving objects now on the surface. All right, well, the weather here near Washington, D.C. is not good today. We've had sleet all morning and it's starting to pile up and snow's coming in later, but it's a beautiful day for a landing on Mars. And we've got some students in uh, Virginia who are learning about Mars on their snow day. Thank you all for joining us. We've also got the Navajo Nation in Arizona, Westmount Public Schools, Laurel Hill Primary First Grade class in South Carolina, as well as the Netherlands tuning in. So thank you all so much for tuning in. And be sure to let us know what questions you have down in the comment section on Facebook. You can give STEM and 30 a follow on Twitter and submit a question there. Um, also, you can go to the website and, uh, and follow us there as well. So, Mariah, we've got another question that's come in. Um, how long will Perseverance operate and what happens once it shuts down? Yeah, uh, another great question. Um, I think the, the nominal mission is at least one Mars year. Um, but we've seen in previous missions that uh, these missions end up lasting a lot longer than they were uh, they were designed for. I think Opportunity was uh, planning for a 90-day, 90-sol uh, mission and lasted 15 years. Um, and the, the, the battery power on the rover can last up to 14 years, I think. So uh, it, it could be much longer and hopefully it will be much longer than, than that one Martian year, which is about two Earth years. Um, but that's sort of the, the nominal mission. Um, and once it's done, hopefully it has, uh, it has uh, placed a samples, a, a Easter egg hunt on the surface for the next rover. Um, and then it'll just stay there in Jezero Crater or, or possibly outside, depending on, on how far we get in our traverse. Um, but it'll wait there until uh, the subsequent rover comes and, and picks up those samples that it cached. Mariah, you were talking about samples, and we've got a question uh, from Facebook, and they would like to know, what are you going to be looking for in the samples that you collect? This is a great question and uh, something that's been discussed a lot on the team and uh, will continue to be discussed as we uh, kind of see what's on the surface and, and uh, actually get a sense of what we will be able to bring back. We've got about 30 sample tubes, I think, so we've got a good amount of things that we can bring back, uh, but we're looking for a diversity in samples, a diversity in rocks. Uh, one of the primary mission goals is to search for ancient signs of life, um, and so we're particularly interested in uh, getting uh, samples from this delta that's preserved on the surface where water used to flow. Um, and so taking samples of that, of that rock uh, of those rocks and bringing them back and sampling them in uh, testing them in laboratories here on Earth. Uh, we've got a lot more instruments and we're maybe 10, 15 years down the line, we've got new instruments that we can't uh, can't use today. Um, we will be looking for, for signs of, of ancient life in those samples. Um, and we'll also be testing the mineralogy. Uh, there's a lot to learn from them. Uh, and also for human exploration, uh, We'll be looking for if there's any kind of uh, hazardous material in in the um, in the soils. Uh, there's often been thoughts that uh, Martian soil has what's known as perchlorate, uh, which is potentially poisonous for uh, human astronauts. Um, so things like that are going to be really interesting to look at. Uh, also looking at the composition of dust, uh, which is pervasive across Mars. Uh, there's lots to be studied, um, but deciding exactly which rocks to sample um, and which to pass on uh, is going to be a really, really interesting thing for the team to have to uh, decide and work together to figure out the best set of samples to send back to Earth. All right. Well, we've got folks tuning in from the Dominican Republic, Casablanca, Morocco, Denmark, South Africa, Cyprus, the Arizona Science Center, Edwin Parr, Composite High School and Homeschoolers in Alaska. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Let us know where you're watching from, and we'll try to give you some shout outs throughout the rest of the show. Um, again, we are going right up until NASA TV takes over the coverage at about 2.15 Eastern time. Uh, Mariah, we've got another question that's come in that I have never thought about before, and I think this is a really cool question. Can the previous rovers 
communicate with each other or with perseverance once it gets there? That's a great question. I've never thought of that either. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think you'd have to ask the engineers. Um, I think theoretically, it seems like it, it, it could be possible. Um, they're, they are pretty far away from one another. Um, so whether or not they'd be able to, to communicate directly, I don't know. Um, but whoever sent that question in should, should look it up and, and tell us the answer sometime. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Uh, you actually stumped an e our expert, and we love that uh, here uh, at the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, we've got uh, people watching from Mexico City, Walden Public Schools in Canada, South Dakota, Alberta, Maine, Iran, and India. And our next question, um, somebody from Costa Rica would like to know, how will this rover's exploration be different from past ones? A great question. Um, so there's a couple things that distinguish it. Um, I, every, every mission that we do on the surface is is different and has kind of different primary science objectives. Um, the Mars 2020 rover will be in a particularly interesting place on the surface um, in Jezero Crater, where we know there was this intercrater lake. There is a, a delta and an inflow channel on, on the west and then an outflow channel on the east. Um, so we know that it was a really dynamic system and one that has the potential to actually maybe host life in the past. Um, so this location is something that really distinguishes the mission. Uh, and then I also think the payload that's included on the spacecraft is really uh, something new. And even though the, you might just looking at it, think it looks uh, pretty similar to Curiosity and uh, some of the instruments have definitely been adapted from what we have on the Curiosity rover. Uh, a lot of instruments are totally new um, and things that we've never tested before. Uh, the Ingenuity helicopter, which the, the rover is bringing along with it, the technology demonstration is going to be uh, trying to do the first powered flights on another planet. Um, and so this will be happening pretty shortly into the mission. So this is entirely new um, and we're really eager to see how, how this thing flies. Uh, flying a helicopter in, on Mars is, is not an easy thing. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be paying close attention to that. But I think there's a lot of new stuff that's going to happen with this mission. So uh, stay tuned. So exciting. And we are about two and a half hours away from landing. We've got about 40 minutes left in this live chat. So please put those questions down in the comments or at Stimmon30 on Twitter or email us as well. Um, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Uh, Mariah, the, the next question that comes in is if we find evidence of life on Mars, then what? <laughs> Great question. Um, well, that would be incredibly exciting, um, and I think that it would uh, it would give us another direction to go in in our exploration of the planet if we if we finally kind of find find life on the surface. Um, there's going to be a lot of planning, I'm sure, that then goes into things that uh, something that's called planetary protection, um, which is making sure that anything we bring back to Earth isn't going to contaminate. Uh, the species here and uh, and bring back something harmful um, and the other way around we want to make sure that we didn't bring accidentally bring anything to Mars that uh, then looks like life on the surface and so we want to make sure that it was uh, real and an organic life that formed on the surface of Mars um, and then we would we would dive into uh, how did it get there um, where is it uh, what what kind of life form does it seem to be um, I'm not an astrobiologist, so I probably won't be answering those questions, but uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of work that goes in uh, if a discovery like that was made. All right. Well, we're talking about a rover that's millions of miles away on Mars and, and you know, communicating with it. And our communication has been a little spotty today, but I think we have John Grant back. John, are you there? <laughs> All right. We've got John back. I, think, I think my internet is uh, not as reliable as the one from Mars. <laughs> oh, well, John, we're glad to have you back. How excited are you about this landing? I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, this is something that only happens every seven or eight years um, in terms of um, landing on Mars. And I think as Mariah has done a wonderful job of pointing out, um, we're really on the threshold of starting to understand whether or not there actually could be life on Mars or has been in the past. So. This is something. Uh, this is something that's got a lot of people's interest. 
Uh, so I want to point out that we still have a lot of people watching from all over Dubai, Norway, homeschoolers in Wisconsin, uh, California, Budapest, Hungary. Uh, let's ask John, since you're back, uh, the McNally family from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, how soon after the rover lands will they launch the helicopter? Well, once, once the rover's down on the surface, there's a, a lot of um, sort of check out and testing that needs to be done to make sure that everything survived the, the landing. So it won't be the, in the next day or two, it'll, it'll be a little bit down the road. Um, but I'm pretty sure given all the excitement and interest that when that is about to happen, everyone will know about it. So you'll have an opportunity to tune in. And I'll add that, that it, it should be pretty early in the mission because it's it's not easy for the rover to drive around with a helicopter attached to its uh, underside. So it shouldn't be too long before we have to wait to, to see those happen. I can't wait to see those. We've got a, a fourth grader doing online learning um, that says they are so ready to see the landing. What's the best way to keep following it? And I know that we can pull up the uh, the NASA website that has the countdown to landing on there. You can head over to the NASA website. Um, we will be live here uh, until about 2.15, and then NASA TV will take over that coverage. And the rover touches down at 3.55 Eastern time, which is about two hours and 26 minutes away. Um, John, another question that has come in, how and where is the rover tested before being sent to Mars? Uh, well, it's tested where they assemble it um, out at the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, and then there's a final checkout process that occurred down in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center before launch. But many of the components um, are actually tested um, as they're being designed, like the parachute and other things are, are checked out in various locations before they're actually assembled into the completed rover. This is truly a group effort. There are many, many different people that have come together and provided various components of this rover to make something that once it's all together, gets at these questions of whether or not there could have been life on Mars. Uh, a next question we have, um, and and I'm going to throw this at John again because I know we've discussed it. <laughs> give what, Mariah a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just so you can catch your breath. Uh, what made this landing site in Jezero so uh, promising? What is it about that area, and how did we choose it? Okay, well, I'll start with the second part of that first. Um, we actually had a very long and involved process, about five years long, where approximately 30 different candidate landing sites were considered um, not only by the science team who um, makes the ultimate recommendation to NASA and, and who, pick, who picks the site, but also by the science community. They brought everybody in and said, if you were gonna go with one place to, to try to bring samples back, to try to find out if there's life on Mars, where would you go? And we whittled down that list and arrived at the Jezero Crater site um, by and large, because there is a large river delta that we see entering from a, a valley that cut through the western rim of the crater that you can see here in this image. And the circle, which is the landing site for Perseverance, is kind of right on the edge of that delta. And what's important is that the sediments that were carried down in that river were deposited out on the floor of the crater, and then that delta grew out across it and sort of preserved them. And what we call the bottom set beds, the, the layers of sediment that are right at the base of the delta um, that were in a lake that were before the delta grew out across it, are the place that we might be able to preserve, if they were ever present, the kind of biosignatures that would let us say something about past life on Mars. So Jezero is really unique in that sense, that it's got this well-preserved delta, these access to these kinds of layers of sediment um, that we think can answer those questions. Awesome. Well, we've got folks tuning in from Germany, Sweden, Cumberland Valley Virtual Academy, Saudi Arabia, and the Philippines, where it's 2 a.m. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, and the fact that that I keep coming back to that kind of blows my mind is that right now, you know, until we discover life, Mars is the only planet we know of completely inhabited by robots. <laughs> and we mentioned earlier that we are going to share some resources with you today so you can learn more about Mars and the fleet of robotic explorers we have sent to the Red Planet. Step 30 has produced a lot of videos on Mars, and we've created a Mars playlist on YouTube. There you will find a whole bunch of videos about Mars, including interviews with experts, animations, and astronauts telling about future journeys to Mars.
Our friends at the Smithsonian Channel have also created a couple of amazing resources. The first is Making Tracks on Mars, the Smithsonian Channel's mission critical special that goes into detail about the entire Mars 2020 mission. Drawing on the resources and research that went into this special, they have created Mars AR, an augmented reality experience. This thing is cool. Interact with Percy and its rover predecessors, and even drive the rover and fly the new Mars helicopter. So we have still got a lot of uh, people watching, a lot of questions coming in. We've got people in Spain, Argentina, Trinidad, uh, Guantanamo Bay, Naval Bay, Serbia, Poland, France, Colorado, and homeschoolers in California. Our next question is, uh, what happens if something goes wrong in the entry, descent, and landing system? Are there any backup plans for that? Uh, <laughs> I don't think either one of us wants to take that one. <laughs> uh, no, there is no backup parachute. Um, there is no backup sky crane. Um, but I think your earlier question about the testing that goes on and the design that goes into this um, instills a sense of confidence that this is a very robust landing system, or as we say, entry, descent, and landing system. Um, and let's not forget that the Curiosity rover, uh, which is operating on Mars, used a very similar process for getting down on the surface. So we do have that sort of heritage to draw on. All right, well, we, uh, we've got folks watching from all over the place. If we haven't given you a shout out yet, be sure to let us know where you're watching from. You can either let us know in the comments section on Facebook or at STEMIN30 on Twitter or email us STEMIN30 at si.edu. We'd love to know where you're watching from and what questions you have for Mariah and John. And our next question uh, comes in. They want to know, how is perseverance and ingenuity situated? Or is ingenuity on top? Is it at the back? Where Where is it? Yeah, so Ingenuity is kind of right underneath the rover. Um, they they made it very small, I think, for, for that reason and because it's it's hard to fly in the thin Martian atmosphere. So uh, it's only a couple pounds, I think, six pounds, um, but it's sort of situated underneath the rover um, and the rover will drop it off on the surface and then drive away um, and then the, the helicopter will try to take flight. We've got Avery from Connecticut, and this is a question that both of you can answer. Uh, Avery would like to know, do you have a favorite part of a ro of the rover and what is it and why? <laughs> so let's start with John since he's laughing. <laughs> uh, you know, my, uh, my involvement in um, some of these rover missions goes back to the spirit and opportunity. and. Um, I think that my favorite part um, would be the mask and the, and the cameras up on top because after you've worked with these for a while, you start to almost see them as living beings. And um, to me, those are sort of, that's the, that even though the, the brains are kind of down inside the rover, when you look at the rover, that kind of looks like the eyes and head. And to me, that's uh, the sort of part of the rover that's most lifelike. What about you, Mariah? Yeah, there's uh, so many great instruments on board. Uh, I think I'd have to say one of my favorites is uh, is definitely that Moxie instrument that I was uh, mentioning before. This is an entirely new instrument, um, and it's really uh, trying to pave the way for human exploration by turning the atmosphere into something that we can really use. Um, so I think that that's an incredibly uh, useful thing and is is really innovative, and it's going to be exciting to see. Uh, how the MOXIE experiments go. I think the other one is the uh, meteorological sensor, uh, which I'm biased. I use that sensor for, for data uh, for my studies. And so it's, um, it's one of my favorites for that reason. Uh, but it's really important that we understand the environment on the surface. And so uh, the META instrument it provides information on the temperature, uh, on wind, on pressure, things uh, like that, that will also help prepare for human exploration by uh, telling us what the surface conditions are uh, and what the environment is like and how these things change over the course of the year. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic uh, system and, and Meta helps us understand that. Awesome. Well, uh, we know we've got a lot of schools watching today. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll go up until about 2.10 today and then the NASA coverage starts at 2.15. So make sure that you're, you're watching NASA TV when the, their coverage starts. 
Um, we've got Mrs. DeSalvo's fourth grade class in Temecula, California watching. And this question, I think, follows up on all of these schools that are watching. Uh, from Macon, Georgia, they wanted both of you to talk a little bit about your educational background and what do you have to study to start working on Mars? Right, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, I uh, grew up in Boston and, and went to Brookline High School um, and was always sort of interested in math and science, uh, but didn't quite know how that, uh, how that would play out moving forward. Uh, when I went to uh, undergrad, to college, I uh, studied astrophysics. And so that's how I sort of got into, into the space field. Um, and then after that, I sort of uh, decided I loved space uh, and I loved studying space, but I wanted to do something a little closer to home. Um, and so Mars was sort of that, that happy medium where I was uh, working in space exploration and, um, and getting to, to work on, on space, space missions, uh, but studying an object that was uh, closer and that we could actually touch and, and see. Um, and so it was sort of that happy medium. Um, I think there are a lot of great things, a lot of different uh, different types of things that you can do to get involved in, in planetary science. I mean, we have uh, a lot of different disciplines that are uh, represented on the team. Um, people that study astrobiology, geologists, um, atmospheric scientists, all sorts of different things. Um, and so it's really about finding what you're uh, passionate about and pursuing that. John, how about you? Um, I grew up in far northern New York, a town called Plattsburgh, and there's a big lake up there called Lake Champlain, and growing up along the shores of that lake, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to learn about the landscape, to learn about the rocks and how water shapes the landscape. Um, and so when I went on from high school to college, I went into a geology program and, and learned about uh, how the, the world and the earth uh, have evolved over time. When I went on to graduate school, um, I worked with a man that had a small grant doing uh, work related to mapping a portion of Mars. And I kind of scratched my head and said, I had no idea that you could do this sort of thing. Uh, and that was sort of the, the switch that, that got turned on. I helped him with his map. Uh, I went on then and, and got my PhD. Um, but like Mariah, I would echo that a very important component is the, the math and science um, that allows you to build on the information that you're seeing in the landscape around you and provide you with the tools to interpret how it has evolved over time. So I think it's a it's a kind of parallel track to what Mariah took, uh, but there's little differences. And I guess what I would point out is uh, while I took a track that was largely um, in geology and Mariah, I think she's being modest, she's got a degree in astrophysics, um, but she's also very interested in how the wind shapes the landscape around her. Yet through these various um, backgrounds, we've all come together uh, and, and work on the same projects together. So you can come at this from a variety of different angles, but I think the core is a strong basis in math and science. As a former teacher, I love hearing what you both said. And, and Mariah, you mentioned following your passion. And one of the things that, that Ben and I have gotten to do while working on STEM and three is talk to some incredible people. And one of the things that they always say is to follow that passion, whatever it is, and during the broadcast day, you've seen some amazing NASA animations and, and uh, those are done by people that their passion is animating and making computer graphics. And there's got to be people that make the food for the astronauts on the space station. So whatever your passion is, whatever your passion is, follow it and you're going to be happy no matter where, where you end up. And I think Mariah and John are great examples of that. We've got still a lot of people from watching from all over Switzerland, Belize, Ireland. Federal public defenders are watching in Philadelphia. So that just goes to show you the wide variety of people who are interested in uh, the Perseverance landing today. We have another question uh, uh, from uh, Miller Middle School in California. They would like to know how does a nuclear reactor on the rover work? And how does it power the gadgets on board? And the other thing uh, I'd like you all to discuss is the difference between nuclear power is kind of new for these. We were using solar pa power and you know, maybe why did we switch? Mariah, you wanna take the first and I'll take the second? Yeah, sure. So um, we have on board what's known as an RTG, uh, gosh, radioisotope thermal generator, I think. Um, and so basically we've got plutonium on board that uh, decays into um, 
into uh, uh, electricity that uh, that we can use to power the instruments. Um, and yeah, as you said, we, we've also used uh, solar panels before, and so maybe John uh, can go into that. He, he worked on the MER rovers, which used those as well. Yeah, um, so with solar power, <clears throat> obviously you're depending on the on the sun shining on the on the solar panels to provide you with the electricity. And one of the things that we know about the environment on Mars is it's it's dusty, and at certain times of the year, it's quite a lot dustier than others. Uh, and you can see a picture now of one of the Mars exploration rovers. This is actually when it's looking fairly clean. Um, so over time, as dust builds up, the amount of power that we get uh, is reduced. With the Mars Exploration Rovers, it turned out that uh, we got very lucky. Um, whirling sort of dervishes in the atmosphere called dust devils would come along every so often and blow off a lot of the dust and we'd get that new rover, that new rover smell back again um, and, uh, and a lot of power. The InSight lander, which is still operating on, on Mars as we speak, also has solar powers, uh, 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 solar panels. Uh, and there is dust that's been building up on those solar panels uh, over time as well. We haven't been fortunate enough to have a large enough dust devil come by to sweep the dust off there. So both kind of power sources are being used. Um, I think there's advantages and disadvantages to both. It really comes down to the kind of mission you're doing. Uh, do you need to do things at a higher latitude where the sun may not be shining as much during part of the year, those sorts of things. Awesome. Well, we are about two hours and 11 minutes away from the Perseverance rover touching down on the surface. Um, and we've got Sophie from Spain wants to know how fast are the rovers and how do they compare to the other ones? Are they doing wheelies on the surface? <laughs> John, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, you know what? Strangely, they can kind of do wheelies on the surface. And by that, I mean, you can actually lock up um, some of the wheels and then turn the other ones and and sort of lift, you know, they're, they're all sort of an independent uh, suspend or independently driven, you can actually kind of pop one up or, or, or something. Having said that, uh, if you are walking on Mars, you would very, very quickly go right beyond the rovers. They're not moving that fast across the surface. Uh, to give you some sense, um, you know, if, if there's no obstacles in the way that we have to go around, a really good day of driving on Mars is on the order of 150 to 200 meters. So somewhere on the order of, you know, one and a half to two football fields. Uh, to give you a sense of the, the distances that we can go in a single day. And just to, to add to that, one of the new things that, that Mars 2020 has is that it's uh, it's got some new technology that's going to allow it to drive autonomously a little bit further than, than Curiosity has been able to in a given drive. So even though they're moving pretty slowly, hopefully we'll be able to make a little bit more progress each day. To follow up on that uh, question, somebody has asked, what's the difference in the wheels of this rover. Now, I know that there were some changes because we've learned some things from past rovers. Uh, John, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, when we landed on the surface with Curiosity, um, the landscape around us has a lot of, um, of rock fragments on it. Um, and the, the wheels, which have held up very well, um, we started to see after a time that there was some damage to them from driving over these sharp, pointy rocks. Um, what that did basically is um, resulted in a little bit of a change in strategy, whereas before we would, might try to necessarily go straightest distance between two lines. Now uh, we would go around uh, things that look like they could damage the wheels. Um, here we are, something like uh, uh, approaching eight years into the mission, and um, the wheels are holding up fine, and, and it looks like it's not going to be something that impedes us. But having said that, the, the wheels on Perseverance um, are designed to uh, be a lot more durable, uh, to withstand those kinds of pointy rocks that were um, doing a little damage to the wheels on Curiosity. So the sense is that um, uh, they're going to hold up quite a lot better uh, on Perseverance than they have on Curiosity. Again, though Curiosity has not been handicapped by the, by the damage that's been occurring. All right, well, we've still got people tuning in. Please submit those questions to us. We've got Greece, Serbia, the UK, North Macedonia, Scotland, Texas, Hawaii again, Arizona, France, Mountain Creek STEM Academy, and homeschoolers in Oklahoma. Thank you all for tuning in. We do really appreciate it. Um, our next question that, that came in is from a 12-year-old, and he wants to know if there are plans to send rovers to other planets and which ones. And, and I'd love to know which planets you all would love to send rovers to. 
Yeah, absolutely. So there's uh, currently the, the uh, Dragonfly mission is uh, in progress. Uh, the, the, this mission is going to send a robotic rotorcraft uh, to Saturn's moon Titan uh, in the next decade. So this will be sort of a, a step up from from the helicopter that we're flying on Mars. This is going to be a, a full rover that uh, that can fly uh, on the surface of Titan. Um, and actually, I think that uh, because Titan has a uh, uh, smaller gravity, lower gravity than Earth, but a similar atmosphere. It's actually uh, a, a good place to fly. Um, and so we we designed this mission specifically to take advantage of that environment. And um, I've heard before, actually, that if a human was standing on the surface of Titan um, and uh, flapped their their arms, they could they could fly as well. So uh, it's a really cool place to be, and uh, definitely a place that I'm excited to spend uh, send a spacecraft. To. John, where would you like to send a rover? Um, you know, <laughs> Mars. <laughs> I'm a Marsophile, um, and I can think of lots of places where I would like to go. But having said that, um, you know, there are, there are different ways to to do things, as Mariah was just describing on the different uh, bodies in our solar system. You know, with asteroids and relatively small bodies, in addition, uh, if there's no atmosphere, you, you might be able to use something called a hopper, where because the gravity is so low, you can kind of bounce around on the surface. Of course, there have been a variety of rovers on the moon. There's been um, uh, some by different countries. There's been uh, very recently rovers from China. Uh, and of course, in the past with Apollo, uh, we had kind of car-sized rovers that drove around the astronauts. Um, so I think that kind of thing is pretty cool. I would love to see a rover that could carry people. Um, and uh, hopefully that's coming in the not too distant uh, future on Mars. Um, so I, I can think of lots of different places, but I keep kind of circling back to Mars. I'm, I'm a little biased. We still have a lot of people watching. Keep those questions coming. We have Gladys Young uh, Elementary in Bethel, Alaska. People from Idaho, uh, Vermont, Woodbury, Woodbury Central High in Iowa, Pakistan, uh, what, my hometown, Memphis, Tennessee, Creekside Academy in North Carolina. We've got some scouts watching in Ox Oxfisher, UK, doing a project on the landing. Uh, Connecticut, Mr. Christian's history class in Jack London High School, uh, Guam and Nepal. And we have had an email in uh, from a woman in Kentucky and her children would like to know, how do you name the the rovers uh john do you just pick them out of the hat uh, as a group of scientists or is there a process there no there's a process there and i think uh, probably some of the people that are online listening right now know about that process um the rovers have been named by students um providing essays um that suggest a name and why they think that name is appropriate um and uh, a young man in uh, virginia is responsible for the name perseverance that was given and if, if you want to learn more about the, the naming of the rover and Alex Mather, who was the kid that, that submitted that name, um, our friend Jaden Jefferson did an interview with him. You can head over to STEM and 30 social media or the Air and Space YouTube channel and check that interview out. Um, they did go into how he chose that name and why it's so appropriate. Um, we've got a question from Ron in Menlo Park, California. Mm -hmm. He wants to know, I heard something about ground penetrating radar, wind facts on perseverance. What are they really hoping to find with that? Um, do you want me to take that? Sure, whichever you want. <laughs> uh, the, the instrument is called RIMFAX, and um, it uses a, a radar signal, a radio signal, to penetrate down into the subsurface. And when there's a change in the properties of the rock, either um, you know a, a difference between layers or composition, some of that energy is, re is um, reflected back up to the rover, and it allows you to build up a picture of what the layers and the structure, the cracks, those sorts of things look like in the subsurface. Um, in the case of, uh, of Rimfax, we hope to be seeing down, you know, on order of uh, up to 30 feet or so. Um, and if there were ice in the subsurface, we could probably, or water, we could probably see those as well, although those are not expected uh, at, the, at the, the Jezero Crater landing site. What's really important about that is as you drive along the surface, uh, as you walk outside your house, you'll notice that there's not necessarily just flat-lying rocks and outcrops, as we call them, everywhere. There's trees growing, you have lawn, um, there's, there's streets, and that covers up a lot of the rocks and precludes you from really seeing how those different places where you can see the rock actually match up with one another. 
And getting what we call context to be able to match up those different outcrops of rock allows us to piece together a much um, more precise um, uh, sort of understanding of how the landscape has evolved over time. So RIMFAX really allows us to go from outcrop to outcrop and connect those up with a three-dimensional picture that we get from imaging into the subsurface. Uh, our next question is about looking for life on Mars. Uh, if we don't find any this time around, uh, any evidence at all, are we going to keep searching or at some point do you think we'll just say, okay, well, there wasn't ever any life on Mars? Uh, I think that we will continue uh, continue the search. Uh, humans tend to uh, enjoy exploring the solar system and figuring out our place in the universe. Um, and to answer those kind of big questions about whether or not we are alone and whether Earth is really unique, um, we need to continue searching for, for signs of life. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to search for life on Mars, and we only have these uh, small, you're sort of looking for a needle in a haystack, and um, every time we land, we're in a new location, and we can search that location, uh, but there are a lot of locations on Mars. We've got a lot of ground to cover, um, and so even if it doesn't, uh, we don't find evidence of it here at Jezero, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist somewhere else on the surface. Um, and as, as I said before, with Mars sample return, um, that will help us really uh, determine whether or not there was uh, potential for life there uh, back with instruments here on Earth. All right, well, we are just about two hours from Perseverance landing on Mars. And this next question I absolutely love, are there any cool Easter eggs or fun details hidden on the rover? Mariah, what can you tell us? What should we look for? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know about any uh, Easter eggs. I know that there was a, uh, a plaque put on in um, commemoration of, of, uh, of COVID victims. Um, and so that was sort of a late addition to, um, and, and I think also to the healthcare workers that uh, have been have been leading the way in, in uh, fighting this pandemic. And so that was sort of a late addition to the spacecraft and, and was put on there. Um, I think there was also a list of names that people could submit their names and, and that got added to the spacecraft as well. Um, but I don't know about any other uh, Easter eggs to, to look for. If you find one while you're watching the coverage today, tweet it to us or, or go back and put it in the comments section or email. We would love to know if you find any. Now, John, there was an Easter egg on previous rovers on the tires, right? Um, With the, the dots? Yeah, so e e when you say Easter egg, I think about something that uh, you're gonna go out and find that's got uh, pretty designs and, and you know, the way I used to make them were green and blue and that sort of thing that you would put in a basket. Um, but, but there are, you know, there are things that are, that are there um, and, and sometimes the tracks that you leave behind also uh, give a little information as well. Awesome. Uh, John, someone would like to know if Perseverance will sing a birthday song to itself in the same way that Curiosity did. And if you want to talk a little bit about why Curiosity would sing itself the birthday song. <laughs> well, we all like to have a birthday song sung to us. Um, it, it makes us feel wanted. And if you're if you're curiosity and you're all alone on Mars, I mean, yes, as Mariah said, there's there's other rovers, but they're no longer working. Uh, I would think if you're uh, if you're lonely, that's a that's a good way to sort of make yourself feel better about things. Uh, hey, why not? If I'm perseverance, um, why not? Uh, why not happy birthday? And and maybe uh, maybe perseverance and curiosity can wish each other happy birthday. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Mariah, are there any backup cameras or instruments? So if, if something fails, is there a backup to it? We have lots of uh, lots of cameras on the rover. And so if uh, if one fails for some reason, we're not uh, completely blind. We've got we've got other ones. Uh, we've got a lot of them that are used primarily for engineering purposes, for driving, for um, scoping out uh, terrain and, and navigation purposes. Um, and then we've got our science cameras. Um, and so they each have kind of uh, their unique purpose, um, but they they all work together. And if uh, one stopped working for some reason, uh, we would have others that that could um, could take over. The other instruments, some of them we don't have backups for. Uh, the meteorological sensor, that's one that uh, if that malfunctions, uh, we're out of luck. 
Um, and unfortunately, actually, one one um, one thing about the Curiosity landing was that uh, part of the wind sensor on the Curiosity rover uh, malfunctioned during the the entry, descent, and landing. And so this was a situation where we had uh, one of those instruments and we couldn't get it back. Um, so we did our best to to understand wind in in other ways. Um, but uh, sometimes, it, yeah, there's only uh, only one and no backup. <laughs> If I could add to that, um, one of the things, you know, big shout out to the engineers uh, at, at JPL. Um, it seems sometimes, you know, something there's a there's an anomaly within an instrument uh, or some aspect of the rover, and you got to remember this thing is on another planet, uh, and and these folks are able, uh, by and large, to troubleshoot and very often find ways around the problem such that the functionality of the rover is completely restored again. So, um, you know, I totally agree with what Mariah said. I just want to say that, that I am astounded and impressed by the ability to troubleshoot and repair things that uh, are located on the surface of another planet. Uh Kind of following up a little bit on that, uh, uh, Lucia and uh, Ariana would like to know, how do we avoid introducing living organisms from Earth into the Martian soil and atmosphere? You yes, or go, go ahead. I can start it off. Um, that's a great question. Uh, this is what we call planetary protection. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes into making sure the spacecraft is sterilized and uh, everything is done in a clean environment um, out of JPL so that uh, we can't uh, contaminate the spacecraft and send those microbes, uh, any microbes from Earth to Mars. So there's a, a lot that goes into making sure that everything is clean, and sterilized um, before it launches off the surface. All right, we've got uh, Shaw Montessori Upper Elementary in Phoenix, Arizona, as well as homeschoolers in Wales and Walnut Grove Secondary School all tuning in as well as Egypt. Thank you all so much for watching. We've got just a few minutes left in this live chat. Um, and then once we wrap up, the NASA TV coverage will start. And we, we really encourage you to watch that. We are at one hour and 55 minutes until touchdown. And so uh, everybody around the museum I know is getting really, really excited about it. John, at the beginning of the show, you cut out a little bit. Um, and I'd kind of like to loop back around because we did get another question about this. It's getting a little crowded around Mars. Can you tell us what's going on with the other missions? Yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of missions at Mars um, that are still operating, um, some from the European uh, Space Agency. There's a mission from India. Uh, and then, of course, um, some prior uh, U.S.-led missions like the Odyssey uh, spacecraft and the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, et cetera. Um, but the recent arrivals uh, just here in this sort of 10-day period have been a new orbiter from the United Arab Emirates called HOPE. Uh, that will remain in an interesting orbit around Mars that allows it to uh, do some up close and personal sometimes, but then sort of whole side of Mars observations at others to understand the atmosphere. Perseverance, in addition to looking for biosignatures, signs of life, 
uh, understanding the geology of the Jezero uh, crater landing site and beyond uh, is part of sample return. Uh, we're going to use the rover to cache samples that will be left on the surface for a fetch rover uh, to come on the next mission to the surface to pick up um, that will then be launched back into orbit and eventually we hope return to Earth. So the next rover uh, from the sort of US European side uh, will in fact be, um, we hope, we hope uh, will be that fetch rover to pick up those samples. Other countries may be doing other things. Awesome, well we're at an hour and 52 minutes until the landing on Mars and Mariah, this next question, um, somebody wants to know, other than communicating back that we've landed safely, what are the first tasks for the rover? Yeah, so I think as, as John mentioned earlier, um, there is a lot of work that goes in uh, right after landing to checking out all the instruments, uh, making sure everything is, is working the way it, it should. We'll turn everything on, start doing diagnostic testing, um, start calibrating the instruments to work uh, in, in the Martian environment, and all of that can take days or weeks. Um, and so those will be kind of the, the first uh, the first set of objectives for the team to accomplish. Um, and then, as I mentioned, shortly after that, uh, we will probably be uh, uh, setting this, uh, the helicopter on the surface um, and then uh, start driving away and, and let the helicopter uh, hopefully do, it, do its test flights. Um, and then we will uh, be on the road and, uh, and we'll start exploring Jezero Crater. John, um, how do we make decisions on where the rover goes every day? And I know that you've had some experience and uh, Mariah has as well. So do you want to tell us a little bit about, if you want to start about how we make those decisions? Yeah, so NASA has lots of acronyms. Um, and so they, they come out in phrases like SOG chair uh, or, or LTP. Uh, what are those things? Well, a SOG chair stands for SOWG, Science Operations Working Group. And that's basically the room full of scientists that sometimes resemble a herd of cats um, that um, all want to do something different with the rover on a different day. They've seen images come down. Uh, their interests are such that they want to go to rock A where everybody else wants to go to rock B. And so there's a lot of discussion about uh, should you go to A, should you go to B? Um, and how many uh, resources from the rover, how much time will that take to do it? And that SOG chair is the person that sort of herds those cats into a, into a consensus that, that decides what's done with the rover on that given day. Now, the other side of that is the LTP, and that stands for long-term planner. Um, and they take a longer look at things. They kind of not worried so much about what we're gonna do today or tomorrow, but how what we do today or tomorrow might affect what we do over the next couple of months. Um, and they're in the back of the, the, the room sort of poking the SOG chair on the back saying, hey, remember, we got to get over there here in, in the next week or two. And so it's really, it's a, it's a team effort. Uh, and I would point out that even though I kind of kiddingly described the scientists as a herd of cats, um, it's not that way at all. Um, it, it really is a very um, uh, congenial, um, um, very fascinating uh, discussion that occurs because you hear all of these inputs from all of these people that have different expertise, that have different perspectives uh, on, on what they think is important and how that fits into the mission objectives. And so by having this process, as opposed to just focusing on one thing and one thing only, I think really leads to uh, an enrichment of the science process and the science return from these missions. All right, well, we are just about out of time. Mariah, I've got one more question from you that came in. Um, why do we need to study Mars? Uh, an important question. Um, one of the reasons that we really want to study Mars is because we know uh, that, that Mars at one point in, in the past looked a lot more like Earth than it does today. Um, so understanding why it changed, how did the, the, the climate change on Mars so much over the last couple billion years um, really helps us kind of get at those questions about habitability, uh, and understanding solar system and planetary formation as a whole. Um, I think that we we often think that we sort of understand everything about planets, but uh, before we ventured off into the solar system, uh, Earth was uh, one data point that we had. And so increasing our understanding of different planetary environments um, and geology on different planets, it helps us get kind of a more comprehensive understanding of 
uh, these long-term processes that are, are guiding planetary uh, evolution and uh, that help us understand where life could exist in our solar system and in other, uh, in, on other planets uh, around other stars as well. Awesome. Well, if you've enjoyed today's program, be sure to head over and give STEM and 30 a follow on social media. We are produced by the National Air and Space Museum, and our goal is to take students to places and meet people virtually that they may never get a chance to meet otherwise. Here's a look at STEM and 30. This is STEM and 30. We're going to have you all create a little demo that you can take home tonight. We're going to do a little bit of math to figure out how far apart they actually are. Here at the National Air and Space Museum, we supersized it. So we have got a really big model of the layers of the atmosphere. It's only a failure if after it didn't work, you stop. Nothing works the first time. You always have to be prepared for redesign. My job is to stare out the window. You know how the teachers say, you ain't gonna never learn anything staring out the window? I disagree. If we can share our passion for science and hopefully inspire them to do the same thing. That's a good question. No, I did not. Well, don't forget that we we're just about out of time, but the coverage of the landing of Perseverance is just getting ready to start over on NASA TV. Juntos Preservaremos, which translates to Together We Persevere, is NASA's first ever Spanish broadcast of a robotic landing on another planet. The 90-minute live stream will highlight the role that Hispanic NASA professionals have had in the success of NASA's Mars 2020 Perseverance mission, featuring interviews with Latino scientists and engineers, as well as astronauts. The show will be hosted by Perseverance engineer Diana Trujillo and will include a children's segment in collaboration with Plaza Sesamo, live commentary of Perseverance's entry, descent and landing, and other special guests. The show will air today starting at 2.30 p.m. Eastern on NASA and Español's social media accounts. The related hashtag is Juntos Preservaremos. STEM and 30 just released our latest episode focused on Mars. In it, you will meet planetary scientists and engineers working on the Mars rover. You'll also meet some amazing students and learn how you can participate at home with a great hands-on experiment. The next episode of STEM in 30 comes out on March 4th, and it's all about stealth. Have you ever wondered what's in the sky that you can't see? Learn about the secretive world of stealth aircraft. You'll explore the F-117 Nighthawk, the B-2 Spirit, and learn with hands-on experiments that show you how to avoid detection. All right, well, be sure to head over to NASA TV to watch the landing. Fingers crossed for a safe landing. Well, uh, I will certainly sit through that seven minutes of terror to see what happens. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for watching.
liftoff. As the countdown to Mars continues, the perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the Red Planet. Welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. We are gearing up for NASA's Perseverance rover to touch down on Mars. Happening in an hour and a half from now, the rover will attempt to land in Jezero Crater. It is the most difficult landing site on Mars ever attempted. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Raquel Villanueva. In the past, mission team members gathered in our mission control for landings. But this time around, we have COVID safety measures in place. Today's landing will look a little different than what you've seen before. I am in a room by myself, and so is my co-host. Here in the Space Flight Operations Facility, team members are in different parts of this building. Some are in mission control. Others are upstairs for landing operations. We also have isolated rooms for our guests on this show. In total, we have eight locations covered by 14 robotic cameras that you will be seeing. One of those locations is the dark room, the heart of NASA's deep space network. Think of it as a giant communication switchboard. This is where spacecraft phone home to us from across the solar system and interstellar space. The deep space network has been tracking Perseverance since it left Earth. And there are lots of ways you can watch landing today. We have a 360 degree camera inside the control room. It lets you experience the landing right along with the team while seeing this broadcast. We also have the clean feed. It shows an uninterrupted view of mission control and audio. También tenemos un programa en español. To tell us about it is host Diana Trujillo, who also works on the mission. Thank you, Raquel. We're so excited to be the sister live broadcast in Spanish. Sintonizate nuestro programa en las redes sociales de Twitter, YouTube y Facebook en la NASA en Español para que nos acompañes a un tour virtual de la NASA con entrevistas con astronautas, con participación de artistas, con entrevistas con científicos e ingenieros de Perseverance, con Plaza Sésamo y mucho más. Te esperamos. Gracias, Diana. And don't forget, we want to see how you are watching the landing today. Use the hashtag Countdown to Mars to send us your photos and videos. To preview what interviews are coming up is my co-host from the JPL News Office, Marina Jurica. Thanks so much, Raquel. The excitement is building behind me right here in Mission Control as we count down to the Perseverance landing. We will be talking to some of the many people who made today possible, from scientists to engineers on the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover team to folks from NASA headquarters giving us a look into the future of Mars exploration. A little later, we will also be speaking with the students who named the rover and the helicopter. Inspirational stories as we prepare for another landing on the Red Planet. Back to you, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. Let's give a shout out to the students around the nation learning about Perseverance's mission to Mars with their teachers. We are happy you're with us on this exciting day. Later in the show, we will be answering some of the questions you submitted through your classrooms. Landing on Mars is complex. The team will be calling out milestones as they happen. It's fast paced and you'll hear lots of technical terms. To help us translate and explain what is going on in Mission Control is Swati Mohan. She is part of Perseverance's landing team. Thanks for guiding us through landing today, Swati. Hi, Raquel. I'm happy to be here today. So Swati, what is the status of the Perseverance rover right now? So Perseverance is still in space right now, about 9,000 miles from Mars. So far, she is healthy and on course. 
And it takes time to send signals between Earth and Mars. Can you let us know how that affects the information you are seeing? Mm -hmm. So Mars is about 127 million miles from Earth right now. That means it takes about 11 minutes from light to travel from Mars to Earth. So all the information that we received from Perseverance actually happened 11 minutes ago. So the round trip is 22 minutes for us to send a command to Perseverance and hear back on the ground that she's received that command. This is what we call two-way light time. That's good to know. And can you tell us who else is in the room with you right now? The operations team is split into two different areas. Here in the cruise mission support area, we have primarily the team that has been flying Perseverance from Earth to Mars. You'll see the placards with the roles of each of the people by their stations. Some of the people you may hear talking today are the flight director, who is the conductor of our operations orchestra here, the entry, descent, and landing activity lead, who is a member of the landing team tasked with understanding the execution of entry, descent, and landing, and then also the telecommunications and entry, descent, and landing communications engineers who will be monitoring the signal from Perseverance through the different paths that we have. Upstairs, in what we call the war room, we have almost the entire entry, descent, and landing operations team. And then across the hall from them, we have the surface mission control room, where the surface operations team is ready and waiting to take over as soon as Perseverance's wheels touch the ground. And you have been part of this mission for years now. Can you tell us what have you been working on? I've been working on Perseverance for almost eight years now as a guidance, navigation, and control engineer working primarily on entry, descent, and landing. One of my big tasks was to help with terrain relative navigation. Perseverance will be the first mission to fly terrain relative navigation. So while she is descending on the parachute, she'll actually be looking at the ground with a camera, seeing where she is with respect to the Martian surface and choosing a safe spot to land that she can get to. After so many years of working on the mission, it's an honor to be here today as the mission commentator. We're happy to have you here. Thanks, Swati. We'll be checking back in with you in just a few minutes as Perseverance approaches its next milestone. But for now, let's learn more about the rover's mission once it lands on Mars. You know, Mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life. The Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes, but not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. This is a wonderful place to live for microorganisms, and it is also a wonderful place for those microorganisms to be preserved so that we can find them now so many billions of years later. There is no other place on Mars that has the unique combination of a lake setting, a beautifully preserved delta, and the diverse mineralogy that we have in Jezero Crater. So it's truly a special landing site. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity. We've added to it a whole new set of science instruments, and these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're gonna be taking uh, microphones with us for the first time we're gonna have uh, that human sense on another planet. Perseverance carries with her a grand experiment in space-faring technology, a helicopter, the name of which is now Ingenuity. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has 
from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're going to seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions, which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 2031. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration on Mars. You are watching live Mars landing commentary and Perseverance is about to reach another important milestone. Swati, can you tell us what is happening? We are at a milestone where the operations team determines whether they're ready to turn off the transmitter to Perseverance. Turning off the transmitter is like taking your hands off of the wheel. At this point forward, Perseverance would be on her own to execute entry, descent, and landing over 500,000 lines of code. Let's listen in. Okay, all stations, we are ready for the transmitter off pole. ACS, are you go? ACS, are you go? ACS is go. Phase two. Phase two is go. Activity. Activity is go. Uplink lead. Go. Systems. Go. go. EDL com. Go. Telecom one. Go. Telecom two. Telecoms go. GDS one. Go. GDS two. Go. Fault protection. Go. Power. Go. Avionics. Go. Thermal. Go. Flight software. Flight software, go. Data management. Go. Propulsion. Go. Art lead. Go. Team chief. Go. Ace. Go. Launch cruise phase lead. Go. Deputy mission. Go. EDL phase lead. Go. Mission assurance. Mission assurance is go. Chief engineer. Chief is go. Project manager. Project go. Mission manager, all stations are go for transmitter off. Copy flight, go for transmitter off. There you have it, Raquel. We have deemed Perseverance ready to execute entry, descent, and landing on her own. Thank you, Swati. As we just heard, Perseverance is now operating on its own as it cruises closer to Mars. To help explain what this mission means for the agency is NASA's Associate Administrator, Thomas Zerbukin. Thomas, this is our fifth rover sent to Mars since 1997. Can you tell us how Perseverance is going to kickstart a new era? Wow, this is such an important date today, and, and it really is the beginning of a new era in a sense that we're going from exploration, kind of with ex experiments on rovers, uh, looking around, uh, doing analysis, to the sample return phase, in which we're not only looking around, uh, looking at the geology, but really turning our rover into a robotic geologist and astrobiologist, collecting samples that we will bring back to Earth. And for us, of course, those are where the best laboratories are of all of humanity. Some of them still remain to be explored by some that are not yet in the science community yet. And that's what we're looking forward to. It's that new phase. The other element that I want to talk about is the amazing technologies that are there. And of course, one of my favorites is the Ingenuity helicopter This in search of this extraterrestrial Wright Brothers moment, you know, controlled flight for the first time elsewhere, Raquel. Great. And we have a student question on video for you from Macy. Hi, my name is Macy Ragsdale. My question is, is anything alive on Mars? Thank you. 
Well, uh, Macy, I'm so glad uh, for your question. It's a question I ask myself. Is anything alive there? And frankly, at the surface where we're going right now with uh, Perseverance, we do not believe there's anything alive uh, right there because of the radiation that's there. It's chilling, cold, and there's really no water there. But guess what? We think that three billion years ago, this looked like a stream that you may see on Earth. And frankly, a lot more similar than Earth with water with a magnetic field, just like the Earth with an atmosphere. And the question is, at that time, three billion years ago, were there single cell organisms just of the type that developed on Earth? So is there life on, on Mars overall? We don't know. But where we're going right now, we're really looking for ancient life. And that's what we're so excited about. Thank you for your time today, Thomas. And thanks to everyone who has been using the hashtag Countdown to Mars. Here are some of the photos that you've sent in so far. Let's take a look. Now, please keep sharing with us how you are watching this moment today. For now, let's go back to Swati for an important update to what's going on in mission control as we get closer to another milestone. Hi, Raquel. This next milestone is a communications pole. So during landing, not only will Perseverance talk directly to Earth, but we'll also be talking to two spacecraft that are currently orbiting Mars, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the MAVEN spacecraft. This pole is to confirm with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft and the MAVEN spacecraft teams that they are ready and on track to support the relay from Perseverance. Let's listen in. EDL Com flight. Go flight. Have you performed the comm check and readiness of the orbiters? We have performed the voice check and the readiness poll and can confirm that MRO, MAVEN, uh, EDA, Radio Science 1 and 2, UHF, DTE, DSN, and EDL GDS are all ready to support. Copy, EDL Com. So we've just heard that we have a confirmation from each of the different orbiters and all of their support equipment on the ground that they are ready and uh, are on track to support the relay from Perseverance. Great. Thank you, Swati. And we just heard that communications readiness poll, which means we are ready to relay the data Perseverance will send to get a better idea of what the rover looks like as it approaches Mars. We have a NASA program called EYES. The visualization lets anyone watching track Perseverance. Here's how the program works. Follow Perseverance on its journey to the surface of the red planet with EYES on the solar system. From your desktop or mobile device, go to eyes.nasa.gov. Click on the banner, and now you're with Perseverance in real time through every step of EDL entry, descent, and landing. This interactive experience lets you ride along from whatever perspective you choose. Click and drag, scroll in, scroll out. Check out the descriptions and explanations to increase your EDL expertise. Experience every entry, descent, and landing event precisely designed and executed to land Perseverance safely on Mars. The EYES experience is based on predictive data but during this broadcast, you'll see a different visualization called Ranger, and it's based on the real communication the team in Mission Control receives from Perseverance in near real time. This is the visualization the team will follow as data fills their screens while monitoring the health of Perseverance on its nerve-wracking course to another successful Mars landing. Enjoy the ride.
you are watching live Mars Landing Commentary. Stepping outside Mission Control to talk to us is Perseverance system engineer, Matt Smith. Thanks for joining us today, Matt. Hey, Raquel. Well, coming from Mission Control, we are going to hear terms related to landing. Can you help us understand what some of them mean? Sure, definitely. Um, one thing you'll hear a lot about is telemetry. So telemetry is just our way of talking about data that's coming from the spacecraft and telling us important things like temperatures on the vehicle, pressure, how much fuel we have left, and other things that we need to understand for uh, the health and safety of the vehicle. Uh, you'll also hear the word nominal, hopefully. Uh, nominal means everything is expected, everything is okay, uh, we're good to go. Uh, you'll hear also a lot about velocity and deceleration. So velocity is just our speed combined with the direction we're going. And deceleration is our slowing velocity. So we're coming in at over uh, 12,000 miles per hour, and we're going to slow down to a nice, comfortable two miles per hour at landing, and that's our deceleration. Uh, speaking of landing, you may hear a couple important terms uh, at landing itself. One is RIMU stable. So the RIMU is a device on the rover that measures the rover's orientation and whether it's moving. So we, we want a nice, stable landing spot without any motion. Uh, you'll also hear UHF stable, hopefully. Uh, UHF stable refers to good telecommunications link with the rover and indicates that we've had a good separation between the descent stage and the rover after the sky crane maneuver. Finally, you may also hear Tango Delta nominal, or touchdown nominal. That means we've touched down on the surface of Mars within the expected uh, range of safe landing speeds. Thanks for that breakdown. Now, this is your first Mars mission. What have you learned from this experience? Yeah, one of my takeaways is that you can almost never be too careful when it comes to Mars. You definitely can't take Mars for granted. You know, we've checked and double checked and triple checked everything on our way to Mars. And, um, you know, even though we've done this once before using the uh, sky crane technique on the Curiosity rover, um, you know, I think everyone's going to have their, uh, everyone's going to hold their breath until we're on the surface of Mars this time around. And we have a social media question coming in. Nor the door on Instagram asks, how complicated is the automated landing sequence and who wrote the code? Yeah, it's quite complicated. Uh, the automated landing uh, software needs to do literally hundreds of things all on its own, just right with sub-second timing accuracy. Uh, and it's the result of many hundreds of people over many years stretching all the way back to Curiosity and then uh, improved for the Perseverance landing today at Jezero Crater. Great. Thanks for your time today, Matt, and good luck. Thanks. Now, landing on Mars is hard. Landing on Mars during a pandemic is even harder. The team behind the Perseverance rover faced one of its biggest challenges when the coronavirus pandemic struck. Here's how they kept the mission going. When the pandemic struck, the future was certainly unknown. It was like walking into a blind, dark alley. You didn't know what was there, what was in front of you, what you were going to have to deal with. It's something that nobody expected. It's something nobody could plan for. So we all were asked to start working from home. Rather than your first priority being mission success and, and getting to the launch pad, your first priority immediately gets displaced, and it's now the safety of the people. And it took a lot of work to put stuff together in order to keep momentum going, to keep people working safely, keep them healthy, and to keep the project uh, on schedule. We called the effort Mars 2020 Safe at Work, and the objective was uh, to keep the team as safe or safer than they would be if they were not working. You know, putting a spacecraft together that's going to Mars and not making a mistake, it's hard no matter what. Uh, trying to do it during the middle of a pandemic, it's, it's a lot harder. And liftoff. As the countdown to Mars continues, the perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the Red Planet. Certainly uh, never done something like this before. Try to lead a team that's flying a spacecraft on the way to Mars while getting ready for landing, while doing it all from home. There's no doubt that working in isolation not virtual isolation, but in physical isolation from everyone else, is a challenge. We had to rethink and redesign what it meant to operate a spacecraft in flight 
when we couldn't all be in the same room in Mission Control, seeing the data come down from Perseverance. It was, it was a major change going to that, you know, looking at everyone on a screen instead of in person. Because of the pandemic, you can't, uh, you know, just pop over your cubicle wall and talk to the person next to you. It's definitely been a challenge to figure out how to communicate and uh, get everything done remotely, um, but we've managed to make it work. We are explorers. Our job is to go into the unknown, and this is just another example of the unknown. We're really doing something that's transformative in trying to understand whether or not life evolved on another planet. That's the fundamental objective of this mission. We're all still connected by this incredible mission and this, um, this wonderful team that we have the opportunity to be a part of, so that keeps at least me going. Pretty much everybody that I've talked to that's associated with the mission has, has said the same thing, which is you could not have come up with a better name than Perseverance. It's an amazing serendipity that we get to persevere through working on Perseverance. Joining us now is Perseverance Deputy Project Manager, Matt Wallace. Matt, just how ambitious is this mission and how does this team stay on track with unexpected challenges like the pandemic? Well, it's a very ambitious mission. You know, we're working on only a host of new, uh, extremely capable science instruments to do that, that science mission that we've talked about, but also uh, a number of technology experiments to provide feed forward information into the next set of robotic explorers or even human exploration of Mars. Uh, so there's a lot for us to do. Uh, we look a lot like Curiosity, but in fact, we're carrying 50% more uh, payload down to the surface of Mars. Uh, and so it, it is a, it's been a big challenge. Um, you know, and it was particularly challenging when the pandemic struck. It came at a critical time in our processing. We were just months away uh, from launching. Uh, we're trying to essentially get the spacecraft assembled, do the final tests. Uh, it did not have a lot of margin in our schedule. And our focus just entirely shifted from that to keeping the team safe and keeping their families safe. Um, and we had to do that quickly, we had to make the adjustment quickly. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we got through it with a lot of help. A lot of people stepped up uh, to make it happen. The team was tenacious, uh, and we managed to get it launched and, and fly it to Mars. It's, and, uh, uh, you know, thanks to a lot of help. And Matt, just how large is the team that worked on Perseverance? It's a big team. Uh, a couple thousand people here just at JPL, in fact, have worked on on mission. Uh, and then almost every other NASA center has contributed in some significant and critical way as well. Uh, we have um, over a thousand industry partners that have provided hardware into this mission from 44 different states, 60 different cities. And of course, we have international contributions from Europe and many other international providers as well. So it's a, it's a big team. It's taken a lot of people to get us uh, to where we're at. That is a big team. This is the most difficult landing site ever attempted. Now, why do you think Perseverance is ready to land in Jezero Crater now? Jezero is tough. I mean, it's scientifically fascinating uh, because it's got a lot of things like craters and uh, uh, you know, rock fields and cliffs and sand dunes and that sort of thing, which are great for the science community. That's exactly the type of features they're looking for to learn more about Mars. But they're all landing hazards for us. Uh, and so we've had to add new technology uh, to relevant navigation, which is the ability essentially to divert away from hazards. Uh, and But we have taken this system through the same types of paces that we have in previous missions. We've used the same techniques, the same uh, best practices for engineering verification. And in many cases, uh, we've used the same people. This, in fact, is my, my fifth Mars rover mission, and I'm not alone. There's other people on the project in the same in the same situation. So, um, you know, the team has given it 
everything they've gotten uh, uh, to put it all put it all out there and uh, to make this successful. And I think we're ready. Thanks, Matt, and good luck on your fifth mission. Thank you very much. Well, Jezero Crater is a location on Mars that has intrigued scientists for years. Let's head over to Marina to learn more about the science goals of the mission. That's right, Raquel. Here to explain why we want to go there is Deputy Project Scientist Katie Stack Morgan. Welcome, Katie. Thanks, Marina. Glad to be here. Now, Perseverance is landing on Mars at the Jezero Crater. Why is it that you and the team chose this particular area? Yeah, so scientists believe the Jezero Crater is one of the best places on Mars and possibly the entire solar system to look for signs of ancient life. Jezero contained an ancient lake and has within it one of the best preserved ancient delta deposits in the, on the surface of Mars. And deltas form when a river enters a relatively open body of water, like an impact crater, and deposits the sediment that it's carrying into the lake. And we know based on studies of deltas and lakes here on Earth that they're great places to concentrate and preserve organics and, and support microbial life. We're also excited because Jethro uh, exposes rocks that um, are between three and a half to more than four billion years old and represent a variety of different geological processes. Now, this might be a tough choice, but what do you think would be the most rewarding scientific discovery that we expect to get from this mission? As hands down, I think the most re re rewarding discovery I think we can make with Perseverance would be finding a truly compelling ancient biosignature on Mars. The rocks in and around Jezero Crater record a period of time when life first arose in the solar system. And we have the opportunity with Perseverance to study the evolution of the planet from a once habitable world likely capable of supporting ancient life to the cold, barren planet we know Mars is today. And why do you think, Katie, it's so important to find out if there really is or was ancient life on Mars? Well, the question of whether there is life beyond Earth is one of the most fundamental and essential questions we can ask. And our ability to ask this question and develop the scientific investigations and technology to answer it is one of the things that make us as a species so unique. And based on everything we know about Mars in the past, it absolutely should have been capable of supporting ancient life. So we can find out an answer to the question, where there were habitable environments, was there life? And studying the possible emergence of life on ancient Mars can also help us better understand the conditions that led to life on our own planet. That's so fascinating, Katie. Now we're gonna take a question from a student, Vara. Hi, I am Vara. And my question is, why was Mars able to sustain lakes and rivers ages ago, but cannot now? Isn't it cold enough to make water? And isn't it always? Thank you. Yeah, that is such a great question. Um, and one of the things that protects our atmosphere here on Earth and allows liquid water to be stable on our own planet is the fact that we have a magnetic field protecting that atmosphere. We think that Mars lost its magnetic field way back year, billions of years ago and left the atmosphere exposed to things like solar winds and cosmic rays that basically blew that atmosphere away. And once that happened, liquid water wasn't stable on the surface of Mars anymore. It was too cold and, there, and, and the pressure was too low. And so now Ma Mars is not capable of supporting liquid water and, and likely not capable of supporting life at its surface. Well, thank you so much, Tavara, for that great question. And a big shout out to all the kids that are watching out there today. And thank you so much to you, Katie, for joining us. That was so great. Thank you. Now sending it back over to you, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. Earlier, we were able to catch up with the communication systems engineer, Chloe Sackier. She helps us break down the system used to track perseverance during landing. The communications infrastructure supporting Perseverance's landing is quite complex. We've rallied a truly global network of relay and communications assets to help us capture and record those precious minutes of entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. We receive a stream of engineering telemetry via these communication assets that helps us see and understand exactly what's happening. Perseverance sends direct to earth X-band tones, each of which provides us with indications of critical entry, descent and landing events. During entry, descent and landing, we have two Mars orbiters listening for the ultra high frequency or UHF signals from Perseverance. These orbiters relay these signals to deep space network stations on Earth, Madrid in Spain, and Goldstone in California. 
the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO, has reconfigured its software to perform a type of relay called bent pipe. This will provide us with near real-time telemetry during entry, descent, and landing. We have coverage from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter from just before entry to a few minutes after landing. The telemetry we receive will be delayed by the time it takes light to travel from Mars to us back on Earth. Additionally, the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution spacecraft, or MAVEN, is recording these UHF signals and will be relaying that recording hours after landing. MAVEN will be covering us from around the time of cruise stage separation until a few minutes after landing. We also receive what we call heartbeat tones, which are indications that the spacecraft is alive and progressing throughout entry, descent, and landing. It's important to note that while unexpected, we could lose our communication links and still land safely. Because Perseverance is doing entry, descent, and landing completely autonomously, she doesn't need our help to joystick the landing. The communication links give us added visibility. And you can see Chloe hard at work inside Mission Control right now. Perseverance's landing might look like the system the Curiosity rover used back in 2012. But landing on Mars is difficult. There's always a risk involved. Here's what needs to happen for Perseverance to touch down safely in Jezero Crater. Nothing can be taken for granted when you get to Mars. There's a lot of things we just don't know. Space always has a way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us. I mean, until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely, I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it. Entry, descent, and landing is often referred to as the seven minutes of terror because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. There are many things that have to go right to get Perseverance onto the ground safely. There's a lot counting on this. This is the first leg of our sample return relay race. There's a lot of work on the line. Starting about 10 minutes before atmospheric entry, we get rid of really the spacecraft part of, of the rover that's been supporting us. We come screaming in to the Martian atmosphere at 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. And the heat shield is what dissipates all that initial energy through friction. The vehicle will continue actually flying itself through the atmosphere. It's sort of like a transforming vehicle that went from a spacecraft, and now it's kind of like an aircraft actively guiding itself. When we're going slow enough, we deploy a parachute. The biggest supersonic parachute we've ever sent to another planet. It's critical for slowing down the vehicle. Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing borrows heavily from that of Curiosity. But fundamentally, Perseverance is a different rover. She's bigger, she has different instruments. We've added a lot of smarts on the inside to make it more capable so that it can deal with the landing site that we've given. The science team identified Jezero Crater as basically an ancient lake bed and one of the most promising places to look for evidence of ancient microbial life and to collect samples for future return to Earth. Uh, the problem is it's a much more hazardous place to land. When you look at Jezero, all you see is danger. How do we go to a site that we never thought was safe enough to go to before? So the heat shield, which has protected us all the way through entry, is no longer necessary. We need to get that off so that we can actually see the ground. And we can see the ground in a couple different ways. Perseverance will be the first mission to use terrain relative navigation. So while it's descending on the parachute, it will actually be taking images of the surface of Mars and determining where to go based on what it sees. This is finally like landing with your eyes open. Having this new technology really allows Perseverance to land in much more challenging terrain than Curiosity or any previous Mars mission could. Amongst the rocks and the craters and the cliffs, these things are hazardous to the rover, but these are the things that are interesting to the scientists. Once Perseverance has figured out where she is, we get us in the back shell and parachute and light up our rockets. Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way down to about 20 meters off the ground. That's when we start the sky canoe. And once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will cut loose from the rover and fly away to a safe distance. But surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. Its job, right, being the first leg of sample return to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. 
And then that's when the real mission begins. With us now is Al Chen. He is Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing lead. Al, you were part of the Curiosity rover landing. Does it get any easier the second time around? It absolutely does not, especially when considering we're trying to land the biggest, heaviest, and most complex rover we've ever built at the most dangerous landing site we've ever attempted. Jezero may look great and you know, promising from a science perspective, but it's absolutely treacherous for landing. There's a cliff, fall, cliff wall that's about 200 feet tall that runs right through the middle of the landing site. There are craters full of sand that even if we landed into them, we would not be able to drive out of. And there are rocks to the east and actually all over the place, rock fields. Uh, that would be a bad day for us if we were to land on them. Now, Al, what new technology makes this type of land, dangerous landing possible? Perseverance is carrying two new technologies that are really kind of under the hood smarts that are allowing us to land at this kind of treacherous landing site. Uh, the first is range trigger. Uh, that's the ability, we've given Perseverance the ability to decide for herself, based on where she is, when to deploy the parachute. Previously, we used to deploy parachutes, that supersonic parachute, based just on navigated velocity. But now Perseverance has the smarts to figure out where she is and deploy that parachute at just the right place to make sure that uh, we shrink where we could come down. That actually reduces the area that error ellipse, the, where we can come down on the ground, uh, from something that was on the order of 15 miles long by 12 miles wide for Curiosity uh, to about five miles long by four miles wide uh, for Perseverance. So that's quite a bit of reduction. Second, uh, the next piece of technology that's helping us land there is terrain relative navigation. Um, in the past, after we popped off the heat shield, we've taken pictures of the ground as it's been coming up, but we haven't really done anything with them. This time, Perseverance is carrying a camera to take pictures, but also a kind of second brain uh, to help it figure out what those pictures are telling it and match it up with an onboard map from a satellite. Uh, that allows it to figure out exactly where she is. Uh, suddenly then, she can, she can then fly to safe spots that are nearby once she really knows where she is. It allows the site to not have to be as flat and boring as a pancake as if some of our past sites had been, the entire area we could come down. Now we just need little pieces of that site to be small enough and safe enough uh, for us to land in safely and fly there after we've, dis after we've gotten rid of the parachute. And we also have a social media question coming in. Sansakari14 on Instagram is asking, how does the sky crane decide where to move itself after the payload lands? After the payload lands, after the rover touches down, uh, the, the sky crane, the descent stage, which is that rocket powered jetpack above it, the first job, of course, is to make sure you don't hurt the rover. So it'll turn forward or backward uh, so that the engine plumes don't pass over the rover. So it'll come up and start to turn. And it'll go in whichever direction is closest to north. So it can either go forward, if that's the way north is, or go toward the rear of the rover, if that's where north is. And it'll fly about a third of a mile or so away. Thanks for talking to us today, Al. Thank you very much. Now, let's head back to Mission Control for an update from SWATI. Hi, Raquel. So, remember that command that we sent at around 11.35 to turn the transmitter off? We are just about to get confirmation that Perseverance has received the command. The command took 11 minutes to go to Perseverance, and then the reply took 11 minutes to get back from Perseverance to the ground, so we should hear uh, any second now that uh, we have officially turned off the transmitter. And after that, we will be about four minutes from the start of entry, descent, and landing mode. At this point, we will transition from the cruise approach mode to entry, descent, and landing. And that means our travel from Earth to Mars is done, and now we just need to get to the surface. So far, things are looking good. Great. Hello, this is Cad 3, ready to show mis uh, estimated miss distance for OD-152. Copy EDL phase, we'll come back. Okay, go ahead. Flight east. Go east. 
Our tracking stations have all confirmed the results of the transmitter drive off and in lock one way. Copy ACE. GDS flight. Flight GDS. At this time, I'd like to disable the alarms before EDL main. So please disable all the alarm files and start a new downlink session. Or Copy that. EDP. Copy that. Proceeding now. Confirmation that we are now officially one way and the transmitter is off. Rover mission has helped shape the other, starting with the landing of the Pathfinder more than 20 years ago, leading up to where we are today with Perseverance. Perseverance Deputy Project Manager Jennifer Trosper has worked on every Mars rover mission and she joins us now. Uh, Jennifer, how does Perseverance fit into the history of exploring Mars? Thanks, Raquel. It's great to be here. Well, Perseverance is NASA's fifth rover on Mars, and I've had the privilege of working on every one of them. And the very first rover was the Sojourner rover we sent in 1997, and it was the size of a microwave oven. And even at that small size, Sojourner was able to transform the way that we explore Mars from stationary landers to small roving robots that go from place to place, just like a geologist would on Earth. So once we had that roving capability, then we sent our twin rovers Spirit and Opportunity. Spirit and Opportunity were tasked with finding evidence of ancient water on Mars. Now they did. They're great explorers and both of them found ample evidence that water had once existed on the surface of Mars. But we had a question, another question then, was Mars ever habitable if water had been there? And that's when we sent Curiosity. Now Curiosity was a major upgrade to our rover fleet. She's the size of a small car. She uh, landed with the sky crane system instead of airbags. And she also carries along her own sample analytics lab and she's still operating today. And during her exploration, she has found evidence of a habitable environment in an ancient lake bed on Mars. So now we're sending Perseverance. Perseverance is tasked with answering the question and looking for evidence of ancient microbial life on Mars. And in order to do this, she has to be the smartest and most capable rover we've ever sent. Speaking of Perseverance, can you tell us more about how Perseverance is smarter than its predecessors? Yes, we've made a lot of upgrades to help her along with the surface mission. One of them is for her autonomous traverse capability. When I say autonomous traverse, I mean we tell her where we want her to end up, and she has to figure out the safe and best way to get there. In order to do that, she uses her cameras, algorithms, a computer. So we've given her another computer, we've upgraded the cameras, and we've upgraded the algorithms. Now she drives three times as fast as Curiosity could drive in this autonomous traverse mode. In fact, her average daily distance for driving, about 200 meters, is close to the maximum distance any rover has ever driven in a day on Mars. So she's fast. Another thing that we've done, which is the most significant upgrade that we've made, is the sample caching system itself. Cur Curiosity has a robotic arm, like Perseverance has a robotic arm, but on the end of Perseverance's robotic arm is a coring drill that will go and take rock cores, transfer them into sample tubes and into the rover, where another robotic arm will take those tubes will seal them and store them and eventually drop them on the surface of Mars for future return to Earth. Great, and we also have a social media question about Perseverance. Erica AS on Instagram wants to know what the wheels of the rover are made out of. Great question. Well, you may think we make them out of some material you've never heard of. It turns out they're made of aluminum. Now, Perseverance's wheels are a little thicker than Curiosity's, but they're actually both made out of aluminum. And one more question for you. Can you tell us more about the importance of where you are right now in the building? Yes, I am above, on the second floor, above the cruise mission support area that you've been watching. And this is the surface mission support area. So as soon as Perseverance lands, all commands, all ta all, this, this room will take over. It will become headquarters for operating Perseverance on Mars. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Jennifer. Thank you.
Now, we now know Perseverance's place in history. Let's take an up-close look at the rover with Mars 2020 system testbed engineer, Elio Morillo. Thank you, Raquel. I'm standing in front of the Mars 2020 Perseverance scaled model. As you can tell, this vehicle is about the size of a Mini Cooper. These wheels are obviously black here and they look like rubber, but they're actually fully made of metal. These wheels are designed to allow us to climb over obstacles and of course climb over hills and minimize the amount of slipping once we're traversing on the surface of Mars. Here in the front of the rover, we have the sample caching system. And of course, at the very front end of this is the robotic arm, which this entire system is arguably the most complex robotic system we've ever sent outside of Earth. Here at the tip of the arm, we have a turret which contains a suite of instruments along with some drills and coring capabilities that will allow us to do contact science once we get to the surface of Mars. Not only that, this robotic system is equipped to collect samples about the size of a piece of chalk that then eventually will be stored inside of the vehicle and dropped off in a later location so that an eventual mission can go and return these samples to Earth, something we've never done in the past. Here in the front, we have the remote sensing mast. Something of note is that this mechanism is going to be stowed upon the touchdown on the surface of Mars. And one of the first critical activities we do is deploy this mechanism. This mechanism includes several cameras that are going to give us some of the most breathtaking images we've ever taken on Mars. Along with that, we have some lasers as well as a spectrometer. They're going to allow us to do some remote science. Here you see some of these extrusions that are part of the larger weather suite of instruments that will allow us to characterize the local climate around Perseverance. So that's a quick tour of the rover, but I gotta get back to work. So back to you. Perseverance is collecting samples of Martian rock for future return to Earth. We've heard that scientists have been wanting to bring Martian samples back for many generations. And here to talk a little bit about that is NASA's Planetary Science Division Director, Lori Glaze, who joins us now to talk about the role Perseverance will play in NASA's future goals. Welcome, Lori. Hi. Now, as you just heard, we've heard that scientists have been wanting to bring back these Martian samples for a very long time. Why do we need to bring them back? That's really a great, great question. You know, we actually have examples of Mars already here on Earth that came here as meteorites. But we don't know exactly where they came from on Mars, and then they also have had to make the trip from Mars to Earth, and so they got altered during that time, and then during their entry and descent into the Earth's atmosphere, that also changes what those, those rocks are like. So being able to go to Mars and actually collect a sample where we know exactly where it came from and we know uh, we can preserve it and keep it pristine and carry it all the way back here, this will be incredibly important to help us answer questions about uh, the geologic history of Mars, uh, understanding how it formed and evolved, and also really important questions about whether or not life actually existed on Mars three and a half billion years ago and whether that life, if it existed, has been preserved in the surface of Mars. Now, Lori, these sample tubes that Perseverance is going to be collecting, they're the cleanest things ever created on Earth. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh my goodness. We worked so hard. The team here at JPL is absolutely incredible to assure that those sample tubes are incredibly clean. One of the main goals of this mission is to be able to detect if there's actual life that's preserved, um, ancient life preserved in those rocks, in those samples. And and we definitely don't want to be carrying, you know, our own DNA off to Mars and then bring it back here to confuse our, our scientists when they're trying to study those samples. So it, it is an incredibly clean uh, set of uh, equipment that's been sent there. As you said, the cleanest thing we've ever sent into space. Now, this is a very complicated campaign. Can you break down for us how it's going to work and if there's any international partners working with us? 
You are correct. The, the Mars sample return campaign is incredibly complex. In fact, it's probably the most challenging thing we've ever tried to do. Uh, but we're definitely not going to try and do it alone. Uh, we have great partners with the uh, European Space Agency. And the way this campaign is going to work, well, perseverance is the first step. Chapter one uh, is going to Mars and collecting the samples. Chapter two is going to be a sample return lander that we hope to launch in around 26 to 28, 2026 to 2028. And that lander, uh, it'll be an American lander carrying uh, a fetch rover that's provided by European Space Agency. And that little fetch rover will drive out and pick up the samples that Perseverance left on the surface of Mars. And the fetch rover will bring them back and load them into uh, a rocket that we call the Mars Ascent Vehicle, which will be the first ever launch from another planet. Uh, and it will launch those samples into orbit around Mars. In the meantime, the European Space Agency will have an orbiter that's in orbit around Mars that can rendezvous and capture those samples and then bring them back to Earth for, for us to study back here in our amazing laboratories. A lot of firsts, it sounds like, Lori. And another first, how is Perseverance and the Mars Sample Return Mission going to help the future exploration, human exploration of Mars? I'm so glad you asked that. I think we're going to get a lot of great information from Mars Sample Return with, again, being able to land uh, the heaviest payload we've ever landed on Mars will be that sample return lander that's critical to us learning how to land humans on Mars. And then we are definitely going to want to be able to launch the humans back off of Mars so that Mars Ascent Vehicle is going to be critical, that, that first step of the first launch from another planet. So exciting, Lori. And speaking about the Mars generation, we're now going to take a student question for you from Livia. Hi, my name is Livia, and my question is, what made you want to study Mars, and why are you working so hard and willing um, to wait so long for a sample? Thank you. <laughs> Oh, Olivia, that is such a great question. Um, and, and I enjoy Mars just because it can tell us so much about how our solar system formed and evolved. Um, all of the planets can tell us different parts of that story, and Mars is a really key piece of that. And one of the main reasons we're willing to wait so long to get the sample back is that we've got great new scientists that are all about your age and in about 10 or 15 or 20 years, you'll be the generation that's going to actually get to work with these samples. When, when they come back, you'll be the scientists and engineers that will, will be the, the next generation to, to change how we think about, uh, about Mars and how we think about life in the solar system. That was a great question, Lori. Reach for the stars, future little scientists and engineers. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Lori. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Back to you, Raquel, for another mission update. Thanks, Marina. The cruise team for Perseverance controls the rover on its way to Mars. And moments ago, they handed it over to the landing team. And it looks like team leaders in mission control are about to talk to both teams. So let's listen in. Uh, the CBM change, uh, as I mentioned previously, is to the EDL reserve to a non-coherent row. activity. Copy flight. EDL phase, go ahead. Okay, I'm like to pep talk, I guess, to the team. All right. Uh, you know, I'm terrible at pep talks. I think you, my reputation precedes me there. And, uh, look, I know this hasn't been easy, right? I'm not even sure we've even been in, all in the same room at the same time. I mean, I'm staring at folks across the, uh, across the Internet as well. Uh, even now, right, only... Yeah. Voice check? Okay. Um, I do want to just extend uh, my heartfelt appreciation from the EDL team to the, uh, to the launch cruise team. Uh, you've done everything we've asked for, right? I mean, you've battled anomalies, you've you know, dealt with CEFIs, you've done everything. Uh, you delivered a healthy spacecraft uh, to the place that we want to go. Um, and she's right on target, right? We did the last maneuver literally two months ago, right? This is pretty incredible, in my opinion. Um, and she's on with the right information to help us land. You know, doing the parameter update last night, we're, we're ready to roll. You've done everything right. So, um, and you've put up with us too, right? You've put up with our eccentricities and uh, the things we like to do in EDL land. So I very much appreciate that. Uh, so uh, you all should sleep in on Friday since uh, I, you, know, you guys have earned it. Um, thanks for literally and figuratively putting us in the right position to succeed. And uh, let's land on Mars together. Copy EDL phase. And 
As flight director, I also would like to thank the whole team, cruise ops, EDL ops, EDL team, and the surface ops as well. It's been an amazing journey. I think we all know that. And it's been my honor and pleasure to work with you all side by side. And your tireless efforts and endurance in the face of our challenges has been truly, truly inspiring. So kudos to you. Mission, would you like to say something? Yeah, just echoing the same words that uh, that Al and Magdi have uh, have mentioned. You guys have overcome great obstacles in the last six and a half months, and it started with an earthquake in this room on launch day at L minus 20 minutes. So I can't be more proud than all of the achievements that you guys have, have uh, pulled off in the last six and a half months. Whatever happens in the next uh, hour and a half, you can be proud of the achievements that you've uh, accomplished so far. I look forward to seeing you on the other side, and I only wish that the rest of our team could be sharing this moment with us. Uh, this is a very unusual event. This room is only as half as full as it would be if we weren't in this pandemic. So missing everybody on the team who's not with us here today. And uh, go EDL. Welcome to the EDL family. <laughs> And with that, Godspeed Perseverance. All right, activity. Go ahead and continue the report. Sure thing, Flight. Um, we've since completed the EDL start anchor. Um, as I was mentioning, we changed our CBM row to EDL reserve two-way non-coherent. That row reinforces our CBM windows disabled, keeps our packetization on, it turns off our ranging and switches to the auxiliary oscillator. We have also started our real-time data product and reinforced Medley on. At this time, we... Um... Now, we just heard Perseverance team leaders thank the cruise team for their work in guiding the rover to Mars. Now, did you know the rover name and Mars helicopter name came from students? Well, a couple weeks ago, Marina was able to catch up with them. Thanks, Raquel. Earlier this year, NASA and our partners held a nationwide essay contest to name our Mars rover. Alex Mather, a seventh grader from Springfield, Virginia, submitted the winning essay that was selected by NASA from a field of more than 28,000 entries from K through 12 students in every state in the U.S. Vanessa Rupani's essay for Ingenuity was so compelling, NASA thought it would be a perfect name for the history-making helicopter helicopter, a technology demonstration carried aboard the Perseverance rover. Alex and Vanessa join us now. Welcome, you guys. Hello, space nerds. Hi. <laughs> now, you got to go to Florida and watch the launch live back in July. Alex, what were you feeling as you saw that rocket launch into the sky? I read a log of books written by astronauts, and every single one of them always talks about the raw power behind a space launch. And I definitely feel like watching the launch invoked that sense of, of well, inspiration mixed with anticipation, along with that rumble in my chest. That's very inspirational. And I'm sure that you have had many conversations with your classmates since this all began. Now, what kind of questions have they asked you? I got some people asking me about what this helicopter is, what this rover is, what are they actually gonna do? So I love that this whole experience sparked a greater interest in the mission in my community. Why do you think it's so important for kids to be inspired by space exploration? Because space is the future and kids are the future. Learning about space and watching the story of humanity spread to the stars happen is watching the future happen and seeing history unfold. The best way to keep our home safe and protect our planet is to learn from the worlds around it. So I think it's really important for the next generation of scientists to be engaged in that type of exploration to make our home the best place it can be. Now, speaking of the future, what has your life been like since naming the rover and helicopter? Has it sparked any future aspirations for the two of you? Oh, man, I am currently applying to a science and technology school for high school. I'm hoping for a NASA internship sometime along the way, with my ultimate goal being to join the incredible team of scientists and engineers 
who are about to make this happen. This whole experience has definitely shown me that I want to go into the space industry. I came home from Florida, did all my college applications and checked aerospace engineering on all the boxes. I mean, the whole time we were there, I was thinking, why would anyone want to do anything else? So true. And the best of luck to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Alex and Vanessa. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. I had a great time. Now, your essays, as well as the top 155 finalist essays, are riding on the Perseverance rover, along with nearly 11 million of the names from all over the world that were submitted before launch. And if you miss the chance to get your name on Perseverance, then you will get another chance to reserve a spot on the next mission to Mars. So make sure that you sign up now at mars.nasa.gov for your boarding pass. As virtual celebrations are happening all over the globe, let's take a look at some of your submissions on our social channels, showing us how you're celebrating the Perseverance landing right now. And remember to hashtag Countdown to Mars and send those in. We would love to show them off. Look at these kids. They are getting so excited. Everyone's watching it. A lot of classrooms are watching it. Oh, and great, someone did a Lego version of Perseverance, which is awesome. It looks fantastic. We love getting all your pictures out there. We've gotten a lot of artwork from kids, which has been great. I know I have a nine-year-old John at home and he loves to draw the rover. And look at that, that is awesome. That's better than anything I could bake, that's for sure. Perseverance in a cake. That looks so great, delicious. I wanna get into that. Another great send in from David Bowie Real. Thank you so much for your submissions. Remember, hashtag Countdown to Mars. We love to see how you're celebrating. Now, you might know our next guest from shows like Emily's Wonder Lab. Joining me now is Emily Kellandrelli. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Now, you are very passionate about getting kids interested in science and space exploration. Why do you think kids are so excited about space? Well, I know the reason I'm excited about space, and I think it's the same reason that many others are excited about space, and it's that the people in the space industry work to answer two of the biggest questions that humans have ever asked. Are we alone in the universe and where did we all come from? And by sending a rover to Mars, we are gaining evidence for the answers to these questions, more evidence than we ever had before. And I, I think that's so exciting. It is. And I know you get loads of interesting questions from kids. Have you gotten any about Mars specifically? Oh my gosh, yes. Everybody loves Mars. It's in movies and books and TV shows and everybody loves Mars. So one of the things that I, I get asked a lot is that, you know, it's called the red planet. Why is it red? Well, it's red because it's literally rusty. The top layer of soil on Mars has iron oxide in it or rust and rust has that brownish red color. So it's, it's red because it's rusty. And also because it's red, they ask, is it red hot? Is it really hot on Mars? And well, no, actually, it's colder than the Earth. It's farther away from the sun. So as you would imagine, it's a little bit colder than the Earth. It also has a really thin atmosphere. So the heat that it does have, it has a hard time keeping in. Um, and so it's a little bit colder. But then I also get asked, what would I weigh on Mars? That's a really fun question. So on Mars, it's a little bit smaller than the Earth. So the gravity there is weaker. It's about three-eighths the gravity that we have here on Earth. So if you weighed 100 pounds here on Earth, you'd weigh 38 pounds on Mars or 100 kilograms here on Earth, 38 kilograms on Mars. Those are all super fun. I think even some adults want to know the answers to those questions, yeah. Emily. <laughs> now, why do you yeah. think it's so important to educate kids about science and give them that great foundation? Well, science is the language of nature and learning about science and learning how to think like a scientist means you are learning how to systematically seek out truth in the world. You are learning the scientific method. You're learning how to be a critical thinker. And honestly, those skills are great for whatever you end up wanting to do in life. True. If you want to be a scientist or an opera singer, that holds true. And what are you most excited about today? 
I mean, humans are launching a robot to Mars. That doesn't happen every day. I think in all of the hecticness that is going on today and all of the nerves, I just hope everyone can take a moment to sit back and remember that we live in a time when humans have the ability to send a robot to another planet. And that is just, that's so cool to me. It is very cool, Emily. Take a deep breath. Thanks for joining us here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Sending it back to you now, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. We are offering lots of ways to ride along with us to Mars. Now put yourself right into the action now with our Perseverance photo booth. You can pose next to the rover, place yourself in our mission control, and even see what you might look like taking a selfie on the red planet. There, you'll also have a chance to sign up to send your name to Mars on NASA's next flight to the Red Planet. It's all available at go.nasa.gov slash Mars 2020 Toolkit. And joining us now is JPL Chief Engineer and Landing Veteran Rob Manning. He will be breaking down key moments coming up, and very few people know more about landing on Mars than Rob, going back to the Pathfinder mission in 1997. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. Yeah, thank you very much, Rick, for, for having me here. And what a wonderful experience. <clears throat> what a wonderful day for a beautiful day in California. We've, we're just all so excited here, anxious, worried, but very hopeful. Uh, Rob, I have a question for you. There is a landing tradition at JPL that involves eating peanuts for good <laughs> luck. Uh, can you tell us how did that start? Yes, it started in the, in the mid-1960s. What happened was we had a series of missions that had failures. The Ranger program in the early 1960s, <clears throat> one after another, failed. And what happened was one day a fellow by the name of Dick Wallace on, the, on Ranger number seven, on the seventh attempt, decided to bring peanuts to the ops area just before the before the launch. And guess what? That mission worked. Now, we're not supposed to be too superstitious. We're engineers and scientists after all, but we love tradition. And ever since then, before launch and before critical events like entry descent landing, we have brought out peanuts and shared them with the team. And it's been really a, a wonderful little experience. And, and so we're, this is something we uh, will do, we're doing right now. And, uh, and it's something that we, we just can't help ourselves. It's just part of the experience. Oh, well, speaking of the experience, how did the Perseverance team keep the tradition alive this year? Well, this year we're passed out little packets of peanuts to the team, and they can sneak a pe one peanut in their mouth for, uh, for as part of the, to keep the tradition alive. But you know, th this is part of the COVID experience. But we can't leave this one uh, undone. So th this is what we're doing, and we're and uh, and, and this is going to help us land safely. All right, thanks, Rob. I have some questions for you a little later on, but we're heading back to Swati Mohan, who is part of the landing team. She'll be calling out key milestone and events as they happen from Mission Control. So let's listen in right now. So right now we're still about 20 minutes from entry and the EDL phase is giving a last minute um, confirmation of what will be happening in the upcoming uh, changes to the vehicle, just to remind the team. Um, and uh, this will allow us to steer our trajectory uh, as we make our way through the atmosphere. Um, and uh, it, this is one of the things that allowed uh, MSL, the Curiosity rover, um, to, uh, um, to land where it did. Um, and we're depending on the same type of entry guidance uh, this time around uh, to help get us very close to our target. Uh, as we make our way uh, through entry, finish, the, uh, finish our, our guided entry um, profile, uh, we'll do a maneuver called uh, heading alignment where we uh, point toward the target uh, and get ready to uh, deploy the parachute. Uh, but th before we deploy the parachute, uh, we need to get rid of a uh, set of balance masses uh, that have been uh, giving us a uh, center of gravity or CG offset um, throughout uh, the guided entry phase. Uh, so these are called the, uh, the entry balance masses. We also call this maneuver um, SUFR, S-U-F-R, or straighten up and fly right. Uh, so we'll go ahead and eject those masses uh, when we get uh, a trigger from the GNC system uh, telling us that we're at the appropriate range to the target to do so. As soon as we deploy those, uh, we will 
no longer have a CG offset, um, and uh, we'll be ready to deploy the uh, parachute 17 seconds later. Right where the Perseverance team is sitting now, what's in store for them as we approach landing? I'm going to hold here for uh, EDL prep as uh, we're about to start that anchor. Copy, piece two. And activity, please call that out when it's ready. Copy, Flip. Let me make the announcement now. Okay. Maggie, you make the announcement that. All right. Now, Rob, uh, you've been right where the Perseverance team is sitting now. Uh, what's in store for them as we approach landing? Well, this is the really, uh, this is the nail biting time. Um, fortunately, we still have ones and zeros coming, but very soon as we approach cruise stage separation, the, the transmitter on this rover that been, we've been using all the way to get to Mars is going to be turned off. Um, so, we're, we, and, and we will lose our ability to see ones and zeros, but the good thing is once the cruise stage is gone, there's another radio that will continue transmitting uh, a tone, so that, like, a, like a flashlight, that will allow us to see, at least see that the vehicle is still on. And that, and the, and that color of that flashlight tells us a little bit what, what state this, the rover's in. But soon after that, um, it won't be very long before we'll be able to hear more ones and zeros coming from the spacecraft. Um, so this is a really exciting time, and, and it's just important to remind, remind people this is a, uh, there's a lot that can go wrong in a day like today. There's, there are thousands of things that have to go right. Yeah, uh, we had success in the past landing on Mars. You'd think it gets easier, but it really doesn't. Why is it still so difficult? Well, it's, <clears throat> well because it's involved thousands and thousands of things, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. We, there, there is, uh, there's 79 pyrotechnic devices. Each have to work perfectly one critical wire short or one key thing mechanism that doesn't work or breaks and it's mission over and so it's you know and and, and so and, and it's very easy we're human beings we're not perfect mistakes can be made um, we count on each other to to find uh, our own mistakes and we, and we uh, work very hard to to learn from the mistakes of the past um, we've had many failures, half, remind people, roughly half, a little, uh, around half of the missions to Mars over history have failed. Um, and so it's, 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 that could happen today too. Even though we've had a nice, wonderful string of successes in the United States, it's still a, 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 still a bit of a gamble. A gamble that we've, we have hoped that we have, we have erred in the side of luck. And, and, and we've stacked the, dice, the, stacked the deck and uh, uh, loaded the dice to make this thing succeed. Um, but um, if, we do, if we do fail, and if something bad happens today, I can tell you, we're going to learn it. We'll have the data that tell us what happened. We'll know why, we'll figure it out. And, and, and if, if we are allowed, we will pick ourselves up and get us back on the horse. And if Congress and NASA allow, we will try again. As we always do, we will learn from our mistakes. And what are the possible scenarios we could be looking at today? Well, there's things, things like uh, uh, you know, one of the key stressful elements for all of us is parachute inflation. Uh, but just even separating from the cruise stage is, is a pretty major event. Lots of devices have to work properly. Um, certainly on um, the heat shield separation, uh, getting, getting the, the descent engine started, there's no less than, than uh, uh, 16 ent rocket motors that have to work, uh, one to, uh, eight to control during entry, another eight to control it during landing. I, I said, it's a lot of stuff and it all has to work. And guess what? We haven't done this before with this vehicle ever. This is this first attempt to actually land. We, we can't try this on Earth. We can't do, uh, we don't have test pilots to try it out on this planet before the big show. So this vehicle is doing it for the first time. We've done the best testing we can do in bits and pieces, but you know, it's, it's as best as we can do. And, and uh, but I think our team is up to it. We've, this team is the best, it's a diverse, intelligent, amazing group of people. Uh, people from all over the world who worked on this, not just here in California, but all over NASA, contributors from aerospace, universities, countries around the world. It is just a, an incredible, remarkable engineering achievement. And I am just so proud of this team. Thanks, Rob. Now, let's listen back into mission control. Flight, you're about 14 minutes from entry interface. The vehicle is 
currently preparing the heat rejection system that has kept the thermal system cool inside the air shell for about the last six months. This will allow the spacecraft to more easily cut the line in upcoming crew stage separation, which is under four minutes now. We have now enabled the rover Pyro bus. That's the pyrotechnic uh, system um, that, that was that's going to powering off the cruise stage devices. That, and, the, and these are the de these are the things in the cruise stage that will that we no longer need. With the pyrotechnic system working, we can you can we can explode the devices. The vehicle is preparing for the upcoming cruise stage operation in about three minutes fifteen seconds by powering off all the devices on the cruise stage in order that they can be safe once the cruise stage is jettisoned. Yeah, this is a this is a this cruise stage has been very reliable. We are firing our first pyros to vent the HRS liquid and gas. Ah, uh, this has been the coolant that's been kept their vehicle from getting too hot in the way to Mars. We have to vent it into space. And this, so this is one of the first uh, major events that take place as part of entry descent landing. Uh, the HRS vent anchor is complete. Yes. We will see the next anchor in approximately three minutes. Okay. We are currently 12 and a half minutes from entry interface. We are coming upon cruise stage separation in two minutes and 20 seconds. What's happening now, Rob? Okay, well, ju we're just waiting. The, 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 the rover is completely in charge. It's doing all the things we've taught it how to do. It's all built into the software. We've tested it over and over and over again. This team has spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, testing this thing for years. And, and, and so this is, uh, this is really the culmination of all that work. So this vehicle is, is, gonna, is getting ready to push that cruise stage away. Uh, once it gets pushed away, um, it, 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 the entry system with the rover inside, with the rover is still in charge, is going to get ready to, to uh, take the vehicle turn it to the right orientation and aim it to Mars and, and, uh, and prepare for entering the atmosphere. This won't be long. Um, be prepared for this event. Taking We're about a minute and a half from the stage separation, about 11 minutes, 20 seconds from entry interface. Okay, so it's about 10 minutes from cruise stage separation until entering the top of the atmosphere. From then on and out, things happen fast. We are switching fast. to MFSK tones. Telemetry will have stopped. Telecom is confirming that the spacecraft has switched to broadcasting tones. These tones are received directly from Perseverance, but have very limited information content. We won't receive real-time information until about uh, nine, ten minutes from now, once the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter starts relaying information from Perseverance. We are under a minute from crew stage separation, about ten and a half minutes from entry interface. It's getting exciting. I have to admit, I am quite anxious, uh, but very hopeful that this machine is going to do what we asked it to do. We are seeing the heartbeat tones. Okay, that means that, we, that there's no more ones and zeros coming, it's just the vehicle telling us it's still alive. We are continuing to receive tones from Perseverance, coming standing by for crew stage separation. Yes. We have indication that crew stage separation has been confirmed by the spacecraft. We're off on a good start. In about one minute, Perseverance's landing software will wake up and begin the final preparations for entry. The first action it will do is to fire warm-up pulses with its entry thrusters. These pulses ensure that the spacecraft gets the thrust that it wants during entry interface. We're about nine minutes from entry interface. Okay, so now the vehicle's on its own. It's, gonna, it's turning itself into the direction of facing the heat shield toward Mars. 
and uh, and we'll eventually uh, uh, hitting the top of the atmosphere. We're not far away. This is going to go very quickly from here on out. That's confirmation that uh, we got shadowed by the uh, cruise stage uh, as it uh, passed through our beam to the Earth. Telecom indicated actually that we could see a signal that the cruise stage went between the Perseverance entry capsule and Earth. So we saw a little blip, uh, the data stream indicating the cruise stage separation. We have confirmation that the vehicle has started warming up those entry thrusters. Warm up pulses have begun. At this point, the spacecraft is trying to stop its spin from the cruise two revolutions per minute down to zero, and then we'll turn to its desired orientation from entry. It will se separate the two balance masks that has kept it balanced during all of cruise. This will allow the entry capsule to have lift when it enters the atmosphere. We have confirmation that the spacecraft has turned to the desired entry attitude. We are about seven and a half minutes from entry interface. Okay, the vehicle is pointed in the right direction. The thrusters are warmed up and doing their job. And now we've spun down from two revolutions per minute that the vehicle had the whole way to, the way to Mars. It was a spin-stabilized spacecraft. And then from here on out, it's going to just be a bullet and can control its orient orientation and attitude via rockets on the back of the back shell. points carrier lock. Uh, sorry, and we're the DTE from uh, Radio Science from uh, Green Bank reports carrier lock. Yes. They see the carrier on the downlink. Flight level one. We are continuing to wait for entry interface. We're about six minutes and 45 seconds from entry interface. We have confirmation from uh, Greenback that they are receiving direct to Earth telemetry via that path. The spacecraft Perseverance is currently transmitting heartbeat tones. These tones indicate that Perseverance is operating normally and has nothing significant to report. This is as expected. We're currently just over six minutes from entry interface. Okay, and now we wait. As soon as we get to the top of the atmosphere, the atm uh, it will be very quickly, which is the entry point. It, it won't be very long before the, the, the atmosphere will start getting thicker and thicker. It's going very quickly at a, at a fairly steep angle of 15 degrees uh, into the atmosphere. And as it starts to slow We're down. just under, uh, we're about five and a half minutes from entry interface. We're still receiving heartbeat tones. Uh, we expect to continue receiving heartbeat tones until about five minutes after entry. At that time, Perseverance will be no longer in view of our antennas here on Earth. About 90 seconds prior to entry, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should begin receiving telemetry from Perseverance and streaming it to Earth in near real time. Uh, there are a few expected short outages, such as when we have a plasma back out or when we enter the peak heating phase. Aside from these outages caused by the plasma blackout, antenna switching, or high dynamic events, spacecraft events, we should have telemetry until about 90 seconds after landing. Uh, a plasma blackout is when the signal from Perseverance isn't strong enough to make it through the superheated, super fast air flowing around the spacecraft all the way down to Earth. Once the temperature drops below that peak heating, we do reacquire the signal from Perseverance. We are currently about four and a half minutes from entry interface. Perseverance continues to report heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. Okay, what, we wait, what we're looking for now is we're, uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should be in view soon of our vehicle and be able to listen to ones and zeros coming from a separate radio that's really designed to talk between spacecraft. Camera reports the electro radio is powered on, ready to receive signals from the lander. Okay, 
MRO is ready and, listen, and able and waiting for the, to hear from our rover. Mars Reconnaissance's orbiter has reported that it's ready to receive the signals from Perseverance. It should be in a few minutes here. We're just Flight local minutes one. from entry interface. We don't need these ones and zeros, as Swati said, uh, but to land safely, but we, we really need it for our own uh, health and well-being today to keep our nerves in control. But. Around this time, a second spacecraft, MAVEN, should begin picking up telemetry from Perseverance and will continue to record that telemetry until several minutes post-landing. We won't get that data for several hours after landing as it's being recorded and then will be forwarded to Earth later. We are continuing to receive heartbeat tones, indicating that everything is nominal. We're currently at about three minutes until entry interface. Okay. Very soon we'll be getting ones and zeros, I hope, from our radio on the rover. The entry interface is nothing more than just an arbitrary place in the sky that we've defined to be above the atmosphere. But, th but from that point on, uh, there's definitely uh, atmosphere, and above it, there isn't We are any. two minutes from entry interface. Perseverance is to transmit heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. So the tones can tell us whether something is bad or not is happening. So, so far, the heartbeat is, is doing well. So the vehicle thinks it's, help, it's uh, in good shape to land, which is a great sign. Uh, We're just under two minutes from entry interface. As it gets closer to Mars, Perseverance is actually being pulled in by gravity and accelerating. By the time Perseverance reaches entry interface point, she should be going just under 5.4 kilometers per second. We're at about 90 seconds from entry interface and standing by for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to pick up the telemetry. We are one minute from entry interface. MROs are in receive mode. We have confirmation that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is now relaying data from Perseverance. We're about 30 seconds from entry interface. Perseverance is going about 5.2 kilometers per second and is about 190 kilometers altitude above the surface of Mars. Confirm your jet data flow. About seconds from entry interface. 5.3 kilometers per second and an altitude of uh, about 150 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The spacecraft is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars to slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target.
navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing MRO plasma blackout at this point. The vehicle should be doing its turns right now. MRO has lost lock. Perseverance. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. MRO has lock again. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. We saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Perseverance is going about one kilometer per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have entered heading alignment, which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in, to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target. Our current velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. MRO is reporting good telemetry lock. We are coming upon the straighten up. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Yes, yes, yes. The navigation yes. has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 430 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Yes. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Yes, yes, Perfect. yes. Perseverance now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 yes. .6 kilometers of the surface. Right. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Almost there. 
We have confirmation that the Lander Vision System has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. We have timing of the landing engines. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to Earth tones. As expected. As expected. Sky crane maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. UHF is good. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance yeah. safely yeah. on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Yeah. At this point, the descent stage has flown away to a safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to transmit direct through Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to Earth. <laughs> Oh. Oh. More reports that are still getting telemetry from the lander. All right, oh. Oh. All, right all stations. Oh, we got it. Touch We're, down there. We're gonna wait for the images. I, uh, wow. This is so exciting. I, the team is beside themselves. It's, oh, it's, it's so surreal. Stay tuned, we might get some pictures. Be great. been riding on this. Yeah. yeah, we just heard the news that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. Yeah. It's not, uh, not the flight. Basically. Flight, we have seen the completion of EDL 3000. Copy activity. That is as expected. Okay. Emerald is still seeing a strong signal from the lander. We have just heard the news yes. that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. Congratulations to the mission. And Looks like we have some more news in. It looks like we're getting the first image. Here, take a look at the first image. Flight, this is OL3. I have uh, the target point on the map when you are ready. We are ready, OL3. Go for it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Flight, I'll be uh, moving in, showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> the team has just put
but the first image from Perseverance on the surface of Mars. Now it comes from the engineering cameras, known as the hazard camera. Uh, this camera is mainly used to help the rover drive safely around Mars, and we will get higher resolution photos later in the day. Look at that, right? You got the safe. <laughs> Nice. This is amazing. For Steve. Stand by for Steve. Yeah, I'm not. 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 <laughs> oh, we just got our second image in. Our second image is in. Okay, so this, these, these, we have a camera in the front and out rear of the, of the, of the spacecraft. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, they're near the ground, so these are pretty close. So you can see the wheels there. Uh, and, 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 the, and they're a little dirty because we've got uh, glass covers over these, these cameras. But uh, we took these seconds after landing, so, so they're still dust in the air from our landing event. Uh, so this is, this is happening. Um, uh, you know, this happened just seconds ago, just arrived. And uh, this is really amazing. And, and uh, we even know where we landed. Uh, this is the most amazing thing. The vehicle has told us where, where it's landed because it knew, figured it out. You know, this is a sign. NASA works. NASA works. And when we put our arms together and our hands together and our brains together, we can succeed. This is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country on all of the problems we, we have. We need to work together to do these kinds of things and make success happen. Joining us now is the acting administrator of NASA, Steve Jurisic. Steve, welcome and congratulations. Hey, thank you. What an amazing day. And how does it feel to have another rover on Mars? Uh, it, it's amazing um, uh, to have Perseverance join Curiosity on Mars. And what a, what a just a credit to the team. I mean, just what an amazing team. Um, to work through all the adversity um, that goes and all the challenges that go with landing a rover on Mars, plus the challenges of COVID and, um, and just an amazing accomplishment. And what does this mean for NASA and its future plans? So for robotic exploration, you know, every time we um, execute a mission with new instruments, we discover new things and things we never thought we would discover. So that's, that always informs our future robotic missions, uh, both landers, rovers, and orbiters. Um, this mission also has technology on it. One of the cool things is the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, it's, a, it's an experiment on this mission. But if it's successful, we can use it as an observation, science observation platform by putting instruments on it and also use it as a scout um, for future rover missions. And, uh, and then just the entry, set, and landing um, capability. Um, it'll allow us to land more and more larger, more ambitious robots on the surface of Mars. And then for human exploration, um, we have the MEDLI, Med, uh, Mars Entry Set and Landing Instrumentation, which is going to give us EDL information. Um, we have the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer. It's going to give us uh, properties, size and properties of dust particles, because when, when we send people, we're going to have to deal with that dust. Um, and uh, just, it's just, this is just an incredible mission because of the science and the technology, and then caching samples for a Mars sample return mission. That will be an amazing mission, the first round trip 
to Mars and back and bringing those samples cached by Perseverance back to Earth to examine with state-of-the-art um, equipment in our laboratories here on Earth. We have so much to look forward to. And we also have a student question coming in from Landon. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Landon Applegate. I'm in sixth grade and I'm going to Academy for Academic Excellence. And my question is, do you think we could get resources from Mars to help on future missions or even as like a launching point? Great question, Landon. Actually, we have an experiment called the, Mox, the Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, or MOXIE, and it's going to gem demonstrate generating oxygen from atmospheric CO2, and that could help gener uh, develop, you know, uh, generate breathable oxygen and even, if we can liquefy it, oxidizer for propulsion systems. So that's a tech demo on Perseverance. And then we're going to continue to characterize the frozen water on and below the surface of Mars and eventually try to figure out how to extract that water from the Martian soil or what we call regolith. And then we can use that for potable water and also break it down into oxygen and hydrogen for rocket fuel. So absolutely, we're going to try to eventually figure out how to live off the land to support human missions to Mars. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Steve. Thank you. And now that Perseverance has safely touched down on Mars, let's learn more about what's in store for the rover. Joining us now is Surface Mission Manager Jessica Samuels. Jessica, your Surface Operations team has now taken over. What are they doing now? Yes, hi Raquel. We are so excited here in the Surface Mission, mission Support area. Uh, the team will do a handover with the entry, descent, and landing team and uh, uh, pass any critical information. And then this team behind us will be the team that does the health and safety assessments daily as we progress on this mission. And what do the upcoming weeks look like for your team? So as we enter Mars time now, uh, the commanding team will be working overnight while the rover is asleep so that uh, we can perform the initial checkouts of our key rover functions and our science instruments. And we have to do this all in time for the regularly scheduled communication pass, which happens in the morning. And so we will be working around the clock uh, making sure that uh, Perseverance is healthy and um, we will begin this exciting adventure. And can you tell me what's it like living on Mars time? It's, uh, it's a little bit like constantly, uh, you know, flying and changing your time zone. Uh, the rover, um, you know, on Earth, the rover wakes up at the same time every day, but on Earth, that's 40 minutes later. So the team is going to be shifting our work schedule by 40 minutes as we come into work over the next few weeks. So it, it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be exciting and, uh, and some, uh, some late, oh, late nights, but, uh, but we're also excited and uh, we uh, can't wait. It's a whole new lifestyle. Yes. We also have a student question for you. This is Sophia's video. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sophia Lopez and my question for NASA is, how is Perseverance going to survive? And here's a drawing that I made from Perseverance thinking about Earth. Thank you. Well, Sophia, Perseverance survives um, with a power source um, that charges its batteries uh, overnight while it sleeps, and it keeps heaters uh, on so that all of our critical electronics can stay warm, um, as well as our mechanism. But it's really uh, survived by the team um, that performs the health and safety assessments every day and communicates with the rover um, and makes sure that uh, she's, she's doing okay. Well, thanks for your time, Jessica, and good luck living on Mars time. Thank you. It should be fun. <laughs> Let's head back to Marina as she gives us a sneak peek into the future at JPL. Thanks so much, Raquel. It's definitely bustling behind me. Uh, it's not quiet like it was just 20 minutes ago. And congrats to the whole team. What an amazing accomplishment. Mike Watkins is the director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He was the mission manager during the Curiosity rover landing on Mars. Welcome, Mike. Oh, thanks. Glad to, glad to be here. 
You can see all my mask markings, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were just celebrating, and rightly so. Now, you've been around for a number of Mars landings. What makes this one special? Well, you know, two things. I mean, it's the biggest and best rover we've ever sent to Mars, um, and, and it can really, you know, do amazing things in terms of, uh, you know, its own scientific exploration of this habitable environment, you know, at Jezero. Um, but, you know, it's also, as, as, as you've heard today, you know, it's the first step in Mars sample return. So really, you know, it's, it's not only doing its own mission, it's setting us up for a series of missions and to bring those samples back. And, you know, a lot of the effort to develop the rover uh, was specifically designed, you know, for that sampling and caching system. It's one of the most complex robotic systems ever made. And, uh, you know, having it down safely means Mars sample return continues right on course and, and, uh, and, and we are moving forward. Wonderful. Now, JPL has a long history with robotic space exploration. Why do you think it's so important to continue to push those boundaries? You know, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, obviously, it, you know, for, for places that are far away, like Mars, and even farther away, uh, you know, like Europa, uh, right now, robots are the, robotic exploration is the only way we can uh, make these scientific discoveries and really understand these early uh, habitable environments. In the case of Europa, maybe it's even still habitable. And, uh, you know, we're not ready to, to, to go there with astronauts yet, uh, but the robots are ready to go there. And so we always, uh, you know, are forerunners and pathfinders uh, of, of, of human exploration. And we start by sending, you know, our eyes and, and arms there in the form of a robot. And um, it is just fantastic to be able to do that and to learn from each rover, learn from the science and the engineering and make the next one better and make more and more discoveries. And every time we do one of these missions, we make fabulous discoveries. And, uh, and you know, each one is, is more exciting uh, than the last. The future does look exciting. Now, as director of JPL, what would you like to say to those teams right now celebrating? Oh, you know, obviously they they have earned it. Let me let me tell you. I mean, they uh, have worked, you know, for years and years on this mission. And then in the past year, of course, we had the COVID experience. And, and you know, I want to thank not only the team, but also, you know, all of JPL. You know, a lot of folks had to had to, uh, had to uh, pitch in here, you know, in terms of making sure our remote telework, you know, our, our IT systems were good enough to, to support folks working from home. You know, all of the folks looking at, uh, at PPE and our safe distancing and reconfiguring facilities uh, to make them safe uh, for the employees. Um, it's just an um, incredible amount of work by the entire lab and of course especially by this team and uh, you know and, and in one sense you know the seven minutes of terror are very exciting uh, but on the other hand you know the missions just started right we, we built the mission you know not to land but actually to drive and get the samples and do other uh, technology um, you know demonstrations and so you know for m much of the team you know uh, this part of the mission's over but but for most of the team the mission's really just starting and so uh, you know I think they're very excited but uh, you know everybody I think can take a big, uh, a deep breath and a sigh of relief uh, now that we are safely down on the surface. Yes, that collective sigh of relief. And I hear a lot of excitement and celebration me behind me as well. So thanks so much for joining me, Mike. It's my pleasure. And thanks to everyone for joining us too. Congrats again to the Mars 2020 Perseverance team for a successful landing. Back to you, Raquel. Now, there will be a flight test coming up for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. And if this technology experiment is successful, it would mark the first time we have taken a power controlled flight on another planet. Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly powered helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team, to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. Compared to Earth, at Mars it's less than 1%. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has just been very fast. 2,000, 2,200, 2,400. 2600. We're spinning between 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy. 
It has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground. And so we will basically go up uh, about three meters and we'll hover there uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out, you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go further. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, we've tested all we can on Earth. We have mathematical models that shows how it will fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the real flight test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle is performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing even right now and it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk and none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. Mimi Ong is the project manager for Ingenuity. She joins us now as they await a chance to check out their helicopter in the coming days. Welcome, Mimi. Thank you, Marina. Oh my goodness, we've been talking about this for months, Mimi. Did you ever think you'd be here at this point? I mean, what's going on in your head right now? This is super exciting. You know, we have been working on Mars helicopter for over six years testing and carefully designing it for operation at Mars. So what's going through my mind? Ingenuity Mars helicopter is finally at the destination that it is designed for. Now that Ingenuity is on Mars, what is the timeline you hope to accomplish as you move forward? We have a series of major milestones between now and Ingenuity's first flight. So tomorrow we'll turn on the helicopter and its space station could confirm health after experiencing the dynamics through the EDL just now. And the next major milestone will be when the rover deploys the helicopter to the surface. And that marks the first moment that Ingenuity operates on its own in a standalone manner. And surviving that first cold frigid night of Mars will be a major milestone. We'll execute a series of checkouts and then we will perform that very important first flight. And if the first flight is successful, we have up to four more flights in the 30 Martian days that we have set aside for our flight experiments. And that's when you finally can breathe, right, Mimi? <laughs> <laughs> now, why is it so important to have that aerial dimension to space exploration? A helicopter flying far ahead of rovers and astronauts in the future can provide high definition re reconnaissance information for the rovers and the astronauts before they take the long journeys. And as importantly, being able to fly will enable us to get to places that we cannot get to with rovers and astronauts, like sites of steep cliffs, deep inside crevices, areas of high scientific interest. It will be game changing. Game changing is right. And we've talked about this a lot. You've mentioned the risk is huge, Mimi, but the reward is high. What will be your greatest reward? You know, our team started with the question of whether a helicopter can fly at Mars, given the extremely thin environment. And we systematically demonstrated a series of technical steps. We demonstrated lift first, and then we demonstrated lift and the first ever powered control rotorcraft flight in simulated Mars atmospheric density. And then we went on to build the full-up helicopter that can not only fly, but operate and survive autonomously at Mars, all under 1.8 kilograms, about four pounds. And each of these major milestones have been a first. And 
the success at each of these has been so rewarding. And along the way, the rewards just kept coming. And I have to tell you, at this moment, it's going up exponentially. <laughs> so after all these tests, analysis, simulations, and more tests on Earth, our team now gets a chance to test, prove, and learn how it works in the actual environment of Mars. Our team can't ask for a bigger reward than that. Oh, Mimi, I'm so happy for you and your team. And now we're going to take a question from social media on Instagram for you. At not Vibhuti asks, is the helicopter going to be doing science? Well, the helicopter ingenuity is a technology demonstration. And we are, well, we are demonstrating the ability to fly and learning how to fly for the very, very first time. And so this is a technology demonstration and a pathfinder for future larger rotorcraft, future missions that will carry much larger instruments. So on this mission, we're not doing any science. We're concentrating on engineering uh, data. How did the vehicle perform? And as you saw uh, Bob Bellram uh, in the video before, we will be taking a few color picture, first ever color pictures uh, from uh, the flying aer aerial vantage point, but they'll be icing on the cake. For this one, this is all about engineering data and how do we fly compared to all our tests we have done on Earth. Mimi, so much for your team and the future generations of scientists and engineers to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you so Great much day. for joining us, Mimi, and good luck to your team with that first test flight. Thank you so much. Now we look forward to the Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter beginning their journeys on Mars as their adventures are just about to start. Go Perseverance and go Ingenuity. Back to you, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. Landing on Mars is never easy, but this team has persevered and NASA's fifth rover is on the red planet. You can still hear them buzzing in the back right now. And to get the latest updates on Perseverance as it explores Mars, follow at NASA Persevere on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank everyone watching for joining us today. And to the students and teachers tuning in, we hope you learned a lot from today's landing. And thank you for all your questions. We have a news briefing coming up at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. That briefing will wrap up the day and include reactions from Perseverance team members. We'll leave you now with some of the landing celebration photos you've shared with us, set to Youngblood's cover of David Bowie's Life on Mars. I'm Raquel Villanueva. Thanks for watching. It's a god of a small the girl with the mousy hair But her mommy is yelling no And her daddy is told her to go But her friend is nowhere to be seen Now she walks through a sunken dream To the seat with the clearest view And she's hooked on the silver screen but the film is a sad and boy For she lived it ten times or more